combined in the dream work in order to produce it. Some insight into these invoked relations is gained from the analysis of admirable dream in which the non-vixit continues the central point. In this dream, expressions of affect of different qualities are concentrated at two points in the manifest content, hostile and painful impulses. In the dream itself, we have the phrase overcome by strange emotions. Overlap one another at point where I destroy my antagonistic friend with a couple of words. At the end of the dream, I am greatly pleased and I am quite ready to believe in a possibility which I recognize as absurd when I am awake, namely that there are revenants who can be swept away by a mere wish. I have not yet mentioned the occasion of this dream. It is an important one and leads us far down into the meaning of the dream. From my friend in Berlin, whom I have designated as Hefel, I had received the news that he was about to undergo an operation, and that the relatives of us living in Vienna would inform me as to his condition. The first few messages after the operation were not very reassuring and caused me great anxiety. I should have liked to go to him myself, but at that time I was afflicted with a painful complaint which made my movement a torment. I now learned from the dream thoughts that I feared for this dear friend's life. I knew that his only sister, with whom I had never been acquainted, had died in, after a brief illness. In the dream, Eiffel tells me about his sister and says, in three quarters of an hour, she was dead. I must have imagined that his constitution was not much stronger and that I should soon be travelling in spite of my health in response to far worse news that I should arrive too late for which I should eternally reproach myself. This reproach that I should arrive too late has become the central point of the dream, but it has been represented in a scene in which the revered teacher of my student years, Bruker, reproaches me of the same thing with a terrible look from his blue eyes. What brought about this alteration of the scene will soon become apparent. The dream cannot reproduce the scene itself as I experienced it. To be sure, it leaves the blue eyes to the other man, but it gives me the part of the annihilator and inversion which is obviously the work of wish fulfillment. My concern for the life of my friend, my self-reproach for not having gone to him, my shame, he had come to me in Vienna unobtrusively. My desire to consider myself excused on account of my illness, all this build up an emotional tempest which is distinctly felt in my sleep and which rages in that region of my dream thoughts. But there was another thing in the occasion of the dream which had quite the opposite effect. With the unfavorable news during the first days of the operation, I received an injunction to speak to no one about the whole affair which hurt my feelings, for it betrayed an unnecessary trust of my discretion. I knew, of course, that this request did not proceed from my friend, but that it was due to clumsiness or excessive timidity on the part of the messenger. Yet the concealed reproach affected me very disagreeably, because it was not altogether unjustified. As we know, only reproaches, which have something in them, have the power to hurt. Years ago, when I was younger than I am now, I knew two men who were friends and who honored me with their friendship and I quite superfluously told one of them what the other have said of him. This incident, of course, had nothing to do with the affairs of my friend Ethel, but I have never forgotten the reproaches to which I had to listen on that occasion. One of the two friends between whom I had trouble was Professor Fleschel. The other one I will call by his baptismal name, Yosef a name which was born also by my friend and antagonist P, who appears in this dream. In the dream, the element unobtrusively points to reproach that I cannot keep anything to myself, and so does the question of Eiffel as to how much of his affairs I have told to P. But it is the intervention of that old memory which transposes the reproach for arriving too late from the present to the time when I was working in Bruckes' laboratory. And by replacing the second person in the annihilation scene of the dream by a Yosef, I enable this scene to represent not only the first reproach, that I have arrived too late, but also that the other reproach, more strongly affected by the repression, 
to the effect that I had not kept secrets. The work of condensation and displacement in this dream, as well as the motives for it, are now obvious. My present trivial annoyance at this injunction, not to divulge secrets, draws reinforcement from the springs that flow far beneath the surface, and so swells to a stream of hostile impulses towards persons who are in reality dear to me. The source which furnishes the reinforcement is to be found in my childhood. I have already said that my warm friendships, as well as my enmities with persons of my own age, go back to childish relations to my nephew, who was a year older than I. In these, he had the upper hand, and I early learned how to defend myself. We lived together, were inseparable, and loved one another. But at times, as the statements of old persons testify, we used to squabble and accuse one another. In a certain sense, all my friends are incarnations of this first figure. They are all revenants. My nephew himself returned when a young man, and then we were like Caesar and Brutus. An intimate friend and a hated enemy have always been indispensable to my emotional life. I have always been able to create them anew, and not infrequently my childish ideal has been so closely approached that friend and enemy have coincided in the same person, but not simultaneously, of course, not in constant alternation, as was the case in my early childhood. How, when such associations exist, a recent occasion of emotion may cast back to the infantile occasion and substitute this as a cause of the effect, I shall not consider now. Such an investigation would properly belong to the psychology of unconscious thought or psychological explanation of the neurosis. Let us assume, for the purposes of dream interpretation, that the childish recollection presents itself or is created by the fantasy with, more or less, the following content. We two children quarrel on account of some object, just what we shall leave undecided, although the memory or illusion of memory has a very definite object in view and each claims that he got there first, and therefore has the first right to it. We come to blows. Might comes before right. According to the indications of the dream, I must have known that I was in the wrong, noticing the error myself. But this time, I am the stronger and take possession of the battlefield. The defeated combatant hurries to my father, his grandfather, and accuses me. I defend myself with the words which I have heard from my father. I hate him because he hit me. Thus, this recollection, or more probably fantasy, which forces itself upon my attention in the course of the analysis, without further evidence, I myself do not know how, become a central item of the dream thoughts, which collects the affective impulses prevailing in the dream thoughts, as the bowl of a fountain collects the water that flows into it. From this point of dream thoughts, flow along the following channels. It serves you right that you have had to make way for me. Why did you try to push me off? I don't need you. I will soon find someone else to play with. Etc. Then the channels are opened through which these thoughts flow back again into the dream representation. For such an otetua ke jimimite, I once had to reproach my deceased friend, Yosef. He was next to me in the line of promotion in Bruke's laboratory, but advancement there was very slow. Neither of the two assistants budged from his place, and youth became impatient. My friend, who knew that his days were numbered, and was bound to no intimate relation to his superior, sometimes gave free expression to his impatience. As this superior was a man seriously ill, the wish to see him, removed by promotion, was susceptible of an obnoxious secondary interpretation. Several years earlier, to be sure, I myself had cherished, even more intensely, the same wish to obtain a post which had fallen vacant. Wherever there are gradations of rank and promotions, the way is opened for suppression of covetous wishes. Shakespeare's Prince Hal cannot rid himself of the temptation to see how the crown fits even at the bedside of his sick father. But as many readily be understood, the dream inflicts this inconsiderate wish not upon me, but upon my friend. It is particularly easy for me to hide my ego in my dreams behind persons of this name, since Joseph was the name of the dream interpreter in the Bible.
As he was ambitious, I slew him. As he would not expect that the other man would make way for him, the man himself has been put out of the way. I harbour these thoughts immediately after attending the unveiling of the memorial of the other man at the university. Part of the satisfaction which I feel in the dream may therefore be interpreted a just punishment. It serves you right. At a funeral of this friend, a young man made the following remark, which seemed rather out of place. The preacher talked as though the world could no longer exist without this one human being. Here was a stirring of revolt in the heart of a sincere man whose grief had been disturbed by exaggeration. But with this speech are connected the dream thoughts. No one is really irreplaceable. How many men have already escorted to the grave? But I am still alive. I have survived them all. I claim the field. Such a thought at the moment when I fear that if I make a journey to see him, I shall find my friend no longer among the living permits only the further development that I am glad once more to have survived someone. That it is not I who have died, but he, that I must of the field as once I was in the imagined scene of my childhood. This satisfaction, infantile in origin, at the fact that I am master of the field, covers the greater part of the effect which appears in the dream. I am glad that I am the survivor. I express this sentiment with the naive egoism of the husband who says to his wife, If one of us dies, I shall move to Paris. My expectation takes it as a matter of course that I am not the one to die. It cannot be denied that great self-control is needed to interpret one's dreams and to report them. One has to reveal oneself as the sole villain among all the noble souls with whom one shares the breath of life. Thus I find it quite comprehensible that the revenants should exist only as long as one wants them, and that they can be obliterated by a wish. It was for this reason that my friend Joseph was punished. But the revenants are the successive incarnations of the friend of my childhood. I am also gratified at having replaced this person for myself over and over again, and a substitute will doubtless soon be found even for the friend whom I am now on the point of losing. No one is irreplaceable. But what was the dream censorship doing in the meantime? Why does it not raise the most emphatic objection to a train of thoughts characterized by such brutal selfishness and transform the satisfaction inherent therein into extreme discomfort? I think it is because other objectionable train of thoughts referring to the same person result also in satisfaction and with their effect cover the proceeding from the forbidden infantile sources. In another stratum of thought, I said to myself at a ceremony of unveiling the memorial, I have lost so many dear friends, some through death, some through the resolution of friendship. Is it not good that substitutes have presented themselves? That I have gained a friend who means more to me than the others could, and whom I shall now always retain at an age when it is not easy to form new friendships. The gratification of having found the substitute for my lost friend can be taken over into dream without interference. But behind it, there are sneaks in the hostile feeling of malicious gratification from the infantile source. Childish affection undoubtedly helps to reinforce the rational affection of today, but childish hatred has also found its way into representation. But besides this, there is in the dream a distinct reference to another train of thoughts which may result in gratification. Some time before this, after long waiting, a little daughter was born to my friend. I knew how he had grieved for the sister whom he had lost at an early age, and I wrote to him that I felt that he would transfer to this child the love he had felt for her that this little girl would at last make him forget his irreparable loss. Thus, this train also connects up with the intermediary thoughts of latent dream content from which paths radiate into most contrary directions. No one is irreplaceable. See, here are only revenants. All those whom one has lost return. And now the bonds of association between contradictory components of the dream thoughts are more tightly drawn by accidental circumstance that my friend's little daughter bears the same name as the girl playmate of my own youth, who was just my own age and the sister of my oldest friend, 
and antagonist. I heard the name Pauline with satisfaction, and in order to allude to this coincidence, I replaced one Yosef in the dream by another Yosef, and found it impossible to suppress the identical initials in the same Fleschel and Eiffel. From this point, a train of thought runs to the naming of my own children. I insisted that the name should not be chosen according to the fashion of the day, but should be determined by regard for the memory of those dear to us. The children's names makes them revenants, and finally, is not the procreation of children for all men the only way to access to immortality? I shall add only a few observations as to the effects of dreams considered from another point of view. In the psyche of the sleeper, an affective tendency, which can be called a mood, may be contained as its dominant element and may induce a corresponding mood in the dream. This mood may be the result of experiences and thoughts of the day, or it may be of somatic origin. In either case, it will be accompanied by a corresponding train of thought. That this ideational content of dream thoughts should at one time determine the affective tendency primarily, while another time it is awakened in a secondary manner by somatically determined emotional disposition is indifferent for the purposes of dream formation. This is always subject to restriction that it can represent only a wish fulfillment and that it may lend its psychic energy to the wish alone. The mood actually present will receive the same treatment as a sensation which actually emerges during sleep, which is either neglected or reinterpreted in the sense of wish fulfillment. Painful moods during sleep become the motive of the dream inasmuch as they awake energetic wishes which dream has to fulfill. The material in which they inherit is elaborated until it is serviceable for the expression of the wish fulfillment. The more intense and more dominating the element of the painful mood in the dream thoughts, the more surely will the more strongly suppressed wish impulses take advantage of opportunity to secure representation. For thanks to actual existence of discomfort, which otherwise they would have to create, they find that the more difficult part of work necessary to ensure representation has already been accomplished. And with these observations, we touch once more upon the problem of anxiety dreams which will prove to be the boundary case of dream activity. End of section 37 Recording by Lambda Section 38 of The Interpretation of Dreams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud Translated by A. A. Brill Section 38 The Secondary Elaboration We will at last turn our attention to the fourth of the factors participating in dream formation. If we continue our investigation of the dream content on the lines already laid down, that is, by examining the origin in the dream thoughts of conspicuous occurrences, we come upon elements that can be explained only by making an entirely new assumption. I have in mind cases where one manifests astonishment, anger or resistance in a dream, and that too in respect of part of the dream content itself. Most of these impulses of criticism in dreams are not directed against the dream content but prove to be part of the dream material taken over and fittingly applied, as I have already shown, by suitable examples. There are, however, criticisms of this sort which are not so derived. Their correlatives cannot be found in the dream material. What, for instance, is meant by the criticism not infrequent in dreams, after all, it's only a dream. This is a genuine criticism of the dream, such as I might make if I were awake. Not infrequently, it is only the prelude to waking, even oftener, it is preceded by a painful feeling which subsides when the actuality of the dream state has been affirmed. The thought, after all it's only a dream, in the dream itself, has the same intention as it has on the stage on the lips of Offenbach's Belle Helene. It seeks to minimize what has just been experienced and to secure indulgence for what is to follow. 
it serves to lull to sleep a certain mental agency which at the given moment has every occasion to rouse itself and forbid the continuation of the dream or the scene. But it is more convenient to go on sleeping and to tolerate the dream, because, after all, it's only a dream. I imagine that the disparaging criticism, after all, it's only a dream, appears in the dream at the moment when the censorship, which is never quite asleep, feels that it has been surprised by the already admitted dream. It is too late to suppress the dream, and the agency therefore meets with this remark, the anxiety or painful emotion which rises into the dream. It is an expression of the esprit d'escalier on the part of the psychic censorship. In this example we have incontestable proof that everything which the dream contains does not come from the dream thoughts, but that a psychic function, which cannot be differentiated from our waking thoughts, may make contributions to the dream content. The question arises, does this occur only in exceptional cases, or does the psychic agency, which is otherwise active only as the censorship, play a constant part in dream formation? One must decide unhesitatingly for the latter view. It is indisputable that the censoring agency, whose influence we have so far recognized only in the restrictions of and omissions in the dream content, is likewise responsible for interpolations in and amplifications of this content. Often these interpolations are readily recognized. They are introduced with hesitation, prefaced by an as-if. They have no special vitality of their own, and are constantly inserted at points where they may serve to connect two portions of the dream content or create a continuity between two sections of the dream. They manifest less ability to adhere in the memory than do the genuine products of the dream material. If the dream is forgotten, they are forgotten first, and I strongly suspect that our frequent complaint that although we have dreamed so much we have forgotten most of the dream, and have remembered only fragments, is explained by the immediate falling away of just these cementing thoughts. In a complete analysis, these interpolations are often betrayed by the fact that no material is to be found for them in the dream thoughts. But after careful examination I must describe this case as the less usual one. In most cases the interpolated thoughts can be traced to material in the dream thoughts, which can claim a place in the dream neither by its own merits nor by way of overdetermination. Only in the most extreme cases does the psychic function in dream formation which we are now considering rise to original creation. Whenever possible, it makes use of anything appropriate that it can find in the dream material. What distinguishes this part of the dream work, and also betrays it, is its tendency. This function proceeds in a manner which the poet maliciously attributes to the philosopher. With its rags and tatters it stops up the breaches in the structure of the dream. The result of its efforts is that the dream loses the appearance of absurdity and incoherence, and approaches the pattern of an intelligible experience. But the effort is not always crowned with complete success. Thus dreams occur which may, upon superficial examination, seem faultlessly logical and correct. They start from a possible situation, continue it by means of consistent changes, and bring it, although this is rare, to a not unnatural conclusion. These dreams have been subjected to the most searching elaboration by a psychic function similar to our waking thought. They seem to have a meaning, but this meaning is very far removed from the real meaning of the dream. If we analyze them, we are convinced that the secondary elaboration has handled the material with the greatest freedom and has retained as little as possible of its proper relations. These are the dreams which have, so to speak, already been once interpreted before we subject them to waking interpretation. In other dreams this tendentious elaboration has succeeded only up to a point. Up to this point consistency seems to prevail, but then the dream becomes nonsensical or confused. But perhaps before it concludes it may once more rise to a semblance of rationality. In yet other dreams the elaboration has failed completely. We find ourselves helpless, confronted with a senseless mass of fragmentary contents. I do not wish to deny to this fourth dream-forming power, which will soon become familiar to us, 
it is in reality the only one of the four dream-creating factors which is familiar to us in other connections, I do not wish to deny to this fourth factor the faculty of creatively making new contributions to our dreams. But its influence is certainly exerted, like that of the other factors, mainly in the preference and selection of psychic material already formed in the dream thoughts. Now there is a case where it is to a great extent spared the work of building, as it were, a façade to the dream by the fact that such a structure, only waiting to be used, already exists in the material of the dream thoughts. I am accustomed to describe the element of the dream thoughts which I have in mind as fantasy. I shall perhaps avoid misunderstanding if I at once point to the daydream as an analogy in waking life. The part played by this element in our psychic life has not yet been fully recognized and revealed by psychiatrists, though M. Benedict has, it seems to me, made a highly promising beginning. Yet the significance of the daydream has not escaped the unerring insight of the poets. We are all familiar with the description of the daydreams of one of his subordinate characters, which Alphonse Daudet has given us in his Nabab. The study of the psychoneuroses discloses the astonishing fact that these fantasies or daydreams are the immediate predecessors of symptoms of hysteria, at least of a great many of them. For hysterical symptoms are dependent not upon actual memories, but upon the fantasies built up on a basis of memories. The frequent occurrence of conscious day fantasies brings these formations to our ken. But while some of these fantasies are conscious, there is a superabundance of unconscious fantasies which must perforce remain unconscious on account of their content and their origin in repressed material. A more thorough examination of the character of these day fantasies shows with what good reason the same name has been given to these formations as to the products of nocturnal thought dreams. They have essential features in common with nocturnal dreams. Indeed, the investigation of daydreams might really have afforded the shortest and best approach to the understanding of nocturnal dreams. Like dreams, they are wish fulfillments. Like dreams, they are largely based upon the impressions of childish experiences. Like dreams, they obtain a certain indulgence from the censorship in respect of their creations. If we trace their formation, we become aware how the wish motive, which has been operative in their production, has taken the material of which they are built, mixed it together, rearranged it, and fitted it together into a new whole. They bear very much the same relation to the childish memories to which they refer as many of the Baroque palaces of Rome bear to the ancient ruins. Those hewn stones and columns have furnished the material for the structures built in the modern style. In the secondary elaboration of the dream content which we have ascribed to our fourth dream-forming factor, we find once more the very same activity which has allowed to manifest itself uninhibited by other influences in the creation of daydreams. We may say, without further preliminaries, that this fourth factor of ours seeks to construct something like a daydream from the material which offers itself. But where such a daydream has already been constructed in the context of the dream thoughts, this factor of the dream work will prefer to take possession of it and contrive that it gets into the dream content. There are dreams that consist merely of the repetition of a day fantasy, which has perhaps remained unconscious, as, for instance, the boys dream that he is riding in a war chariot with the heroes of the Trojan War. In my autodidasca dream, the second part of the dream at least is the faithful repetition of a day fantasy, harmless in itself, of my dealings with Professor N. The fact that the exciting fantasy forms only a part of the dream or that only a part of it finds its way into the dream content, is due to the complexity of the conditions which the dream must satisfy at its genesis. On the whole, the fantasy is treated like any other component of the latent material, but it is often still recognizable as a whole in the dream. In my dreams there are often parts which are brought into prominence by their producing a different impression from that produced by the other parts. They seem to me to be in a state of flux to be more coherent, and at the same time more transient than other portions of the same dream. I know that these are unconscious fantasies which find their way into the context of the dream,
but I have never yet succeeded in registering such a fantasy. For the rest, these fantasies, like all the other component parts of the dream thoughts, are jumbled together, condensed, superimposed, and so on. But we find all the transitional stages, from the case in which they may constitute the dream content, or at least the dream façade, unaltered, to the most contrary case in which they are represented in the dream content by only one of their elements, or by a remote allusion to such an element. The fate of the fantasies and the dream thoughts is obviously determined by the advantages they can offer us against the claims of the censorship and the pressure of condensation. In my choice of examples for dream interpretation, I have, as far as possible, avoided those dreams in which the unconscious fantasies play a considerable part, because the introduction of this psychic element would have necessitated an extensive discussion of the psychology of unconscious thought. But even in this connection, I cannot entirely avoid the fantasy, because it often finds its way into the dream complete, and still more often perceptibly glimmers through it. I might mention yet one more dream, which seems to be composed of two distinct and opposed fantasies, overlapping here and there, of which the first is superficial, while the second becomes, as it were, the interpretation of the first. Footnote. I have analysed an excellent example of a dream of this kind, having its origin in the stratification of several fantasies, in the Fragment of an Analysis of a Case of Hysteria, Collected Papers, Volume 3. I undervalued the significance of such fantasies for dream formation as long as I was working principally on my own dreams, which were rarely based upon daydreams, but most frequently upon discussions and mental conflicts. With other persons it is often much easier to prove the complete analogy between the nocturnal dream and the daydream. In hysterical patients an attack may often be replaced by a dream. It is then obvious that the daydream fantasy is the first step for both these psychic formations. The dream, it is the only one of which I possess no careful notes, is roughly to this effect. The dreamer, a young unmarried man, is sitting in his favourite inn, which is seen correctly. Several persons come to fetch him, among them someone who wants to arrest him. He says to his table companions, I will pay later, I am coming back. But they cry, smiling scornfully, We know all about that, that's what everybody says. One guest calls after him, There goes another one. He is then led to a small place where he finds a woman with a child in her arms. One of his escorts says, This is Herr Müller. A commissioner or some other official is running through a bundle of tickets or papers repeating, Müller, Müller, Müller. At last the commissioner asks him a question which he answers with a yes. He then takes a look at the woman and notices that she has grown a large beard. The two component parts are here easily separable. What is superficial is the fantasy of being arrested. This seems to be newly created by the dream work. But behind it the fantasy of marriage is visible, and this material, on the other hand, has been slightly modified by the dream work, and the features which may be common to the two fantasies appear with special distinctness, as in Galton's composite photographs. The promise of the young man, who is at present a bachelor, to return to his place at his accustomed table the scepticism of his drinking companions, made wise by their many experiences, their calling after him, there goes, marries, another one, are all features easily susceptible of the other interpretation, as is the affirmative answer given to the official. Running through a bundle of papers and repeating the same name corresponds to a subordinate but easily recognized feature of the marriage ceremony, the reading aloud of the congratulatory telegrams which have arrived at irregular intervals, and which, of course, are all addressed to the same name. In the personal appearance of the bride in this dream, the marriage fantasy has even got the better of the arrest fantasy which screens it. The fact that this bride finally wears a beard, I can explain from information received. I had no opportunity of making an analysis. The dreamer had, on the previous day, been crossing the street with a friend who was just as hostile to marriage as himself, and had recalled his friend's attention to a beautiful brunette who was coming toward them. The friend had remarked, Yes, if only these women wouldn't get beards as they grow older like their fathers. Of course, even in this dream there is no lack of elements with which the dream distortion has done deep work. Thus the speech, I will pay later, 
may have reference to the behaviour feared on the part of the father-in-law in the matter of a dowry. Obviously all sorts of misgivings are preventing the dreamer from surrendering himself with pleasure to the fantasy of marriage. One of these misgivings, at with marriage he might lose his freedom, has embodied itself in the transformation of a scene of arrest. If we once more return to the thesis that the dream work prefers to make use of a ready-made fantasy instead of first creating one from the material of the dream thoughts, we shall perhaps be able to solve one of the most interesting problems of the dream. I have related the dream of Marie, who was struck on the back of the neck by a small board, and wakes after a long dream, a complete romance of the period of the French Revolution. Since the dream is produced in a coherent form, and completely fits the explanation of the waking stimulus, of whose occurrence the sleeper could have had no foreboding, only one assumption seems possible, namely that the whole richly elaborated dream must have been composed and dreamed in the short interval of time between the falling of the board on cervical vertebrae and the waking induced by the blow. We should not venture to ascribe such rapidity to the mental operations of the waking state so that we have to admit that the dream work has the privilege of a remarkable acceleration of its issue. To this conclusion, which rapidly became popular, more recent authors, Le Lorraine, Egier, and others, have opposed emphatic objections. Some of them doubt the correctness of Valerie's record of the dream. Some seek to show that the rapidity of our mental operations in waking life is by no means inferior to that which we can without reservation ascribe to the mental operations in dreams. The discussion raises fundamental questions which I do not think are at all near solution. But I must confess that Egger's objections, for example to Marie's dream of the guillotine, do not impress me as convincing. I would suggest the following explanation of this dream. Is it so very improbable that Marie's dream may have represented a fantasy which had been preserved for years in his memory in a completed state, and which was awakened, I should like to say, alluded to, at the moment when he became aware of the waking stimulus. The whole difficulty of composing so long a story with all its details, in the exceedingly short space of time which is here at the dreamer's disposal, then disappears. The story was already composed. If the board had struck Maori's neck when he was awake, there would perhaps have been time for the thought, why, that's just like being guillotined. But as he is struck by the board while asleep, the dream work quickly utilizes the incoming stimulus for the construction of a wish fulfillment, as if it thought, this is to be taken quite figuratively, here is a good opportunity to realize the wish fantasy which I formed at such and such a time while I was reading. It seems to me undeniable that this dream romance is just such a one as a young man is wont to construct under the influence of exciting impressions. Who has not been fascinated, above all a Frenchman and a student of the history of civilization, by descriptions of the reign of terror, in which the aristocracy, men and women, the flower of the nation, show that it was possible to die with a light heart, and preserve their ready wit and the refinement of their manners up to the moment of the last fateful summons? How tempting to fancy oneself in the midst of all this as one of these young men who take leave of their ladies with a kiss of the hand and fearlessly ascend the scaffold. Or perhaps ambition was the ruling motive of the fantasy, the ambition to put oneself in the place of one of those powerful personalities who, by their sheer force of intellect and their fiery eloquence, ruled the city in which the heart of mankind was then beating so convulsively who were impelled by their convictions to send thousands of human beings to their death, and were paving the way for the transformation of Europe, who in the meantime were not sure of their own heads, and might one day lay them under the knife of the guillotine, perhaps in the role of a Girondiste, or the hero Danton. The detail preserved in the memory of the dream, accompanied by an enormous crowd, seems to show that Marie's fantasy was an ambitious one of just this character. But the fantasy prepared so long ago need not be experienced again in sleep. It is enough that it should be, so to speak, touched off. What I mean is this. If a few notes are struck and someone says, as in Don Juan, that is from the marriage of Figaro by Mozart, memories suddenly surge up within me, none of which I can recall to consciousness a moment later. 
The phrase serves as a point of eruption from which a complete whole is simultaneously put into a condition of stimulation. It may well be the same in unconscious thinking. Through the waking stimulus, the psychic station is excited, which gives access to the whole guillotine fantasy. This fantasy, however, is not run through in sleep, but only in the memory of the awakened sleeper. Upon waking, the sleeper remembers in detail the fantasy which was transferred as a whole into the dream. At the same time, he has no means of assuring himself that he is really remembering something which was dreamed. The same explanation, namely that one is dealing with finished fantasies which have been evoked as wholes by the waking stimulus, may be applied to other dreams which are adapted to the waking stimulus, for example to Napoleon's dream of a battle before the explosion of a bomb. Among the dreams collected by Justine Tobowulska in her dissertation on the apparent duration of time in dreams, I think the most corroborative is that related by Macario, 1857, as having been dreamed by a playwright, Casimir Bonjour. Bonjour intended one evening to witness the first performance of one of his own plays, but he was so tired that he dozed off in his chair behind the scenes just as the curtain was rising. In his sleep he went through all the five acts of his play and observed all the various signs of emotion which were manifested by the audience during each individual scene. At the close of the performance, to his great satisfaction, he heard his name called out amidst the most lively manifestations of applause. Suddenly he woke. He could hardly believe his eyes or his ears. The performance had not gone beyond the first lines of the first scene. He could not have been asleep for more than two minutes. As for the dream, the running through the five acts of the play and the observing the attitude of the public toward each individual scene need not, we may venture to assert, have been something new produced while the dreamer was asleep. It may have been a repetition of an already completed work of the fantasy. Tobowulska and other authors have emphasized a common characteristic of dreams that show an accelerated flow of ideas namely that they seem to be especially coherent and not at all like other dreams, and that the dreamer's memory of them is summary rather than detailed. But these are precisely the characteristics which would necessarily be exhibited by ready-made fantasies touched off by the dream work, a conclusion which is not, of course, drawn by these authors. I do not mean to assert that all dreams due to a waking stimulus admit of this explanation, or that the problem of the accelerated flux of ideas and dreams is entirely disposed of in this manner. And here we are forced to consider the relation of this secondary elaboration of the dream content to the other factors of the dream work. May not the procedure perhaps be as follows? The dream-forming factors, the efforts at condensation, the necessity of evading the censorship, and the regard for representability by the psychic means of the dream first of all create from the dream material a provisional dream content, which is subsequently modified until it satisfies as far as possible the exactions of a secondary agency. No, this is hardly probable. We must rather assume that the requirements of this agency constitute from the very first one of the conditions which the dream must satisfy, and that this condition, as well as the conditions of condensation, the opposing censorship, and representability simultaneously influence in an inductive and selective manner the whole mass of material in the dream thoughts. But of the four conditions necessary for dream formation, the last recognized is that whose exactions appear to be least binding upon the dream. The following consideration makes it seem very probable that this psychic function, which undertakes the so-called secondary elaboration of the dream content, is identical with the work of our waking thought. Our waking, pre-conscious thought behaves towards any given perceptual material precisely as the function in question behaves towards the dream content. It is natural to our waking thought to create order in such material, to construct relations, and to subject it to the requirements of an intelligible coherence. Indeed, we go rather too far in this respect. The tricks of conjurers befool us by taking advantage of this intellectual habit of ours, 
in the effort to combine in an intelligible manner the sensory impressions which present themselves we often commit the most curious mistakes and even distort the truth of the material before us the proofs of this fact are so familiar that we need not give them further consideration here we overlook errors which make nonsense of a printed page because we imagine the proper words the editor of a widely read french journal is said to have made a bet that he could print the words from in front or from behind in every sentence of a long article without any of his readers noticing it he won his bet years ago i came across a comical example of false association in a newspaper after the session of the french chamber in which dupuy quelled the panic caused by the explosion of a bomb thrown by an anarchist with the courageous words the meeting will continue the visitors in the gallery were asked to testify as to their impressions of the outrage among them were two provincials one of these said that immediately after the end of a speech he had heard a detonation but that he had thought that it was the parliamentary custom to fire a shot whenever a speaker had finished the other who had apparently already listened to several speakers had got hold of the same idea but with this variation that he supposed the shooting to be a sign of appreciation following a specially successful speech thus the psychic agency which approaches the dream content with the demand that it must be intelligible which subjects it to a first interpretation and in doing so leads to the complete misunderstanding of it is none other than our normal thought in our interpretation the rule will be in every case to disregard the apparent coherence of the dream as being of suspicious origin and whether the elements are confused or clear to follow the same regressive path to the dream material at the same time we note those factors upon which the above mentioned chapter six c scale of quality in dreams from confusion to clearness is essentially independent those parts of the dream seem to us clear in which the secondary elaboration has been able to accomplish something those seem confused where the powers of this performance have failed since the confused parts of the dream are often likewise those which are less vividly presented we may conclude that the secondary dream work is responsible also for a contribution to the plastic intensity of the individual dream structures if i seek an object of comparison for the definitive formulation of the dream as it manifests itself with the assistance of normal thinking i can think of none better than those mysterious inscriptions with which de fliegen die blatter has so long amused its readers in a certain sentence which for the sake of contrast is in dialect and whose significance is as scurrilous as possible the reader is led to expect a latin inscription for this purpose the letters of the words are taken out of their syllabic groupings and are rearranged here and there a genuine latin word results at other points on the assumption that letters have been obliterated by weathering or omitted we allow ourselves to be deluded about the significance of certain isolated and meaningless letters if we do not wish to be fooled we must give up looking for an inscription must take the letters as they stand and combine them disregarding their arrangement into words of our mother tongue the secondary elaboration is that factor of the dream work which has been observed by most of the writers on dreams and whose importance has been duly appreciated havelock ellis gives an amusing allegorical description of its performances <clears throat> Quote, as a matter of fact we might even imagine the sleeping consciousness as saying to itself here comes our master waking consciousness who attaches such mighty importance to reason and logic and so forth quick gather things up put them in order any order will do before he enters to take possession End quote. the identity of this mode of operation with that of waking thought is very clearly stated by delacroix in his sur la structure logique du rêve page 526 quote, this function of interpretation is not particular to the dream it is the same work of logical coordination that we use on our sensations when awake. End quote. J. Sully is of the same opinion, and so is Toba Wolska. Quote, With these series of incoherent hallucinations, the mind must do the same work of logical coordination that it does with the sensations when awake. With a bond of imagination, 
It reunites all the disconnected images and fills in the gaps found which are too great. End quote. Some authors maintain that this ordering and interpreting activity begins even in the dream and is continued in the waking state. Thus Poulon, page 547, quote, However, I have often thought that there might be a certain deformation, or rather reformation, of the dream when it is recalled. The systematizing tendency of the imagination can well finish, after waking, the sketch begun in sleep. In that way, the real speed of thought will be augmented in appearance by improvements due to the wakened imagination. End quote. Leroy and Tobolwolska, page 504. Quote, in the dream, on the contrary, the interpretation and coordination are made not only with the aid of what is given by the dream, but also with what is given by the wakened mind. It was therefore inevitable that this one recognized factor of dream formation should be overestimated, so that the whole process of creating the dream was attributed to it. This creative work was supposed to be accomplished at the moment of waking, as was assumed by Goblo and with deeper conviction by Foucault, who attributed to waking thought the faculty of creating the dream out of the thoughts which emerged in sleep. End quote. In respect to this conception, Leroy and Tobolwolska expressed themselves as follows. Quote, it was thought that the dream could be placed at the moment of waking, and they attributed to the waking thoughts the function of constructing the dream from the images present in the sleeping thoughts. Unquote. To this estimate of the secondary elaboration, I will add the one fresh contribution to the dream work which has been indicated by the sensitive observations of H. Silberer. Silberer has caught the transformation of thoughts into images in flagranti by forcing himself to accomplish intellectual work while in a state of fatigue and somnolence. The elaborated thought vanished, and in its place there appeared a vision which proved to be a substitute for usually abstract thoughts. In these experiments, it so happened that the emerging image, which may be regarded as a dream element, represented something other than the thoughts which were waiting for elaboration, namely the exhaustion itself, the difficulty or distress involved in this work, that is, the subjective state and the manner of functioning of the person exerting himself rather than the object of his exertions. Silberer called this case, which in him occurred quite often, the functional phenomenon in contradistinction to the material phenomenon which he expected. Quote, For example, one afternoon I am lying extremely sleepy on my sofa, but I nevertheless force myself to consider a philosophical problem. I endeavour to compare the views of Kant and Schopenhauer concerning time. Owing to my somnolence, I do not succeed in holding on to both trains of thought, which would have been necessary for the purposes of comparison. After several vain efforts, I once more exert all my willpower to formulate for myself the Kantian deduction in order to apply it to Schopenhauer's statement of the problem. Thereupon I directed my attention to the latter, but when I tried to return to Kant, I found that he had again escaped me, and I tried in vain to fetch him back. And now this fruitless endeavour to rediscover the Kantian documents mislaid somewhere in my head suddenly presented itself my eyes being closed, as in a dream image, in the form of a visible plastic symbol, I demand information of a grumpy secretary who, bent over a desk, does not allow my urgency to disturb him. Half straightening himself, he gives me a look of angry refusal. End quote. Other examples which relate to the fluctuation between sleep and waking. Quote, example number two. Conditions, morning while awaking while to a certain extent asleep, crepuscular state, thinking over a previous dream, in a way repeating and finishing it, I feel myself drawing nearer to the waking state, yet I wish to remain in the crepuscular state. Seen, I am stepping with one foot over a stream, but I at once pull it back again and resolve to remain on this side. End quote. Quote, example number six, conditions the same as in example number four, he wishes to remain in bed a little longer without oversleeping. I wish to indulge in a little longer sleep. Seen, I am saying goodbye to somebody, and I agree to meet him or her again before long. End quote. I will now proceed to summarize this long disquisition on the dream work. 
we were confronted by the question whether in dream formation the psyche exerts all its faculties to their full extent without inhibition or only a fraction of them which are restricted in their action. Our investigations led us to reject such a statement of the problem as wholly inadequate in the circumstances. But if, in our answer, we are to remain on the ground upon which the question forces us, we must assert to the two conceptions which are apparently opposed and mutually exclusive. The psychic activity in dream formation resolves itself into two achievements, the production of the dream thoughts and the transformation of these into the dream content. The dream thoughts are perfectly accurate and are formed with all the psychic profusion of which we are capable. They belong to the thoughts which have not become conscious, from which our conscious thoughts also result by means of a certain transposition. There is doubtless much in them that is worth knowing, and also mysterious, but these problems have no particular relation to our dreams, and cannot claim to be treated under the head of dream problems. On the other hand, we have the process which changes the unconscious thoughts into the dream content, which is peculiar to the dream life and characteristic of it. Now this peculiar dream work is much farther removed from the pattern of waking thought than has been supposed by even the most decided depreciators of the psychic activity in dream formation. It is not so much that it is more negligent, more incorrect, more forgetful, more incomplete than waking thought. It is something altogether different, qualitatively, from waking thought, and cannot therefore be compared with it. It does not think, calculate, or judge at all, but limits itself to the work of transformation. It may be exhaustively described if we do not lose sight of the conditions which its product must satisfy. This product, the dream, has above all to be withdrawn from the censorship, and to this end the dream work makes use of the displacement of psychic intensities, even to the transvaluation of all psychic values. Thoughts must be exclusively or predominantly reproduced in the material of visual and acoustic memory traces, and from this requirement there proceeds the regard of the dream work for representability which it satisfies by fresh displacements. Greater intensities have, probably, to be produced than are at the disposal of the night dream thoughts, and this purpose is served by the extensive condensation to which the constituents of the dream thoughts are subjected. Little attention is paid to the logical relations of the thought material. They ultimately find a veiled representation in the formal peculiarities of the dream. The effects of the dream thoughts undergo slighter alterations than their conceptual content. As a rule, they are suppressed. Where they are preserved, they are freed from the concepts and combined in accordance with their similarity. Only one part of the dream work, the revision, variable in amount, which is affected by the partially wakened conscious thought, is at all consistent with the conception which the writers on the subject have endeavoured to extend to the whole performance of dream formation. End of section 38. Recording by John Trevithick. Section 39 of The Interpretation of Dreams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud. Translated by A. A. Brill. Section 39. The Forgetting of Dreams, Part 1. Among the dreams which have been communicated to me by others, there is one which is at this point especially worthy of our attention. It was told me by a female patient who had heard it related in a lecture on dreams. Its original source is unknown to me. This dream evidently made a deep impression upon the lady, since she went so far as to imitate it. That is, to repeat the elements of this dream in a dream of her own, in order by this transference to express her agreement with a certain point in the dream. The preliminary conditions of this typical dream were as follows. A father had been watching day and night beside the sick bed of his child. After the child died, he retired to rest in an adjoining room, but left the door ajar, 
so that he could look from his room into the next, where the child's body lay surrounded by tall candles. An old man, who had been installed as a watcher, sat beside the body murmuring prayers. After sleeping for a few hours, the father dreamed that the child was standing by his bed, clasping his arm and crying reproachfully. Father, don't you see that I am burning? The father woke up and noticed a bright light coming from the adjoining room. Rushing in, he found that the old man had fallen asleep, and the sheets and one arm of the beloved body were burnt by a fallen candle. The meaning of this affecting dream is simple enough, and the explanation given by the lecturer, as my patient reported it, was correct. The bright light shining through the open door onto the sleeper's eyes gave him the impression which he would have received had he been awake, namely, that a fire had been started near the corpse by a falling candle. It is quite possible that he had taken into his sleep his anxiety, lest the aged watcher should not be equal to his task. We can find nothing to change in this interpretation. We can only add that the content of the dream must be overdetermined, and that the speech of the child must have consisted of phrases which it had uttered while still alive, and which were associated with important events for the father. Perhaps the complaint, I am burning, was associated with the fever from which the child died, and, Father, don't you see, to some other affective occurrence unknown to us. Now, when we have come to recognize that the dream has meaning, and can be fitted into the context of psychic events, it may be surprising that a dream should have occurred in circumstances which called for such an immediate waking. We shall then note that even this dream is not lacking in a wish fulfillment. The dead child behaves as though alive. He warns his father himself. He comes to his father's bed and clasps his arm, as he probably did in the recollection from which the dream obtained the first part of the child's speech. It was for the sake of this wish fulfillment that the father slept a moment longer. The dream was given precedence over waking reflection because it was able to show the child is still living. If the father had waked first, and had then drawn the conclusion which led him into the adjoining room, he would have shortened the child's life by this one moment. There can be no doubt about the peculiar features in this brief dream which engage our particular interest. So far we have endeavoured mainly to ascertain wherein the secret meaning of the dream consists, how it is to be discovered, and what means the dream work uses to conceal it. In other words, our greatest interest has hitherto been centred on the problems of interpretation. Now, however, we encounter a dream which is easily explained, and the meaning of which is without disguise. We note that, nevertheless, this dream preserves the essential characteristics which conspicuously differentiate a dream from our waking thoughts, and this difference demands an explanation. It is only when we have disposed of all the problems of interpretation that we feel how incomplete is our psychology of dreams. But before we turn our attention to this new path of investigation, let us stop and look back, and consider whether we have not overlooked something important on our way hither. For we must understand that the easy and comfortable part of our journey lies behind us. Hitherto, all the paths that we have followed have led, if I mistake not, to light, to explanation, and to full understanding. But from the moment when we seek to penetrate more deeply into the psychic processes in dreaming, all paths lead into darkness. It is quite impossible to explain the dream as a psychic process, for to explain means to trace back to the known, and as yet we have no psychological knowledge to which we can refer such explanatory fundamentals as may be inferred from the psychological investigation of dreams. On the contrary, we shall be compelled to advance a number of new assumptions, which do little more than conjecture the structure of the psychic apparatus and the play of the energies active in it, and we shall have to be careful not to go too far beyond the simplest logical construction, since otherwise its value will be doubtful. And even if we should be unerring in our inferences, and take cognizance of all the logical possibilities, we should still be in danger of arriving at a completely mistaken result, owing to the probable incompleteness of the preliminary statement of our elementary data. We shall not be able to arrive at any conclusions as to the structure and function of the psychic instrument from even the more careful investigation of dreams or of any other isolated activity, or, at all events, we shall not be able to confirm our conclusions. To do this, we shall have to collate such phenomena 
as the comparative study of a whole series of psychic activities proves to be reliably constant. So that the psychological assumptions which we base on the analysis of the dream processes will have to mark time, as it were, until they can join up with the results of other investigations, which, proceeding from another starting point, will seek to penetrate to the heart of the same problem. A. The forgetting of dreams. I propose, then, that we shall, first of all, turn our attention to a subject which brings us to a hitherto disregarded objection, which threatens to undermine the very foundation of our efforts at dream interpretation. The objection has been made from more than one quarter that the dream which we wish to interpret is really unknown to us, or, to be more precise, that we have no guarantee that we know it as it really occurred. What we recollect of the dream, and what we subject to our methods of interpretation, is, in the first place, mutilated by the unfaithfulness of our memory, which seems quite peculiarly incapable of retaining dreams, and which may have omitted precisely the most significant parts of their content. For when we try to consider our dreams attentively, we often have reason to complain that we have dreamed much than we remember, that unfortunately we know nothing more than this one fragment, and that our recollection of even this fragment seems to us strangely uncertain. Moreover, everything goes to prove that our memory reproduces the dream not only incompletely, but also untruthfully, in a falsifying manner. As on the one hand, we may doubt whether what we dreamed was really as disconnected as it is in our recollections, so on the other hand, we may doubt whether a dream was really as coherent as our account of it. Whether in our attempted reproduction we have not filled in the gaps which really existed, or those which are due to forgetfulness, with new and arbitrarily chosen material. Whether we have not embellished the dream, rounded it off and corrected it, so that any conclusion as to its real content becomes impossible. Indeed, one writer, Spita, surmises that all that is orderly and coherent is really first put into the dream during the attempt to recall it. Thus, we are in danger of being deprived of the very object whose value we have undertaken to determine. In all our dream interpretations, we have hitherto ignored these warnings. On the contrary, indeed, we have found that the smallest, most insignificant, and most uncertain components of the dream content invited interpretations no less emphatically than those which were distinctly and certainly contained in the dream. In the dream of Irma's injection, we read, I quickly called in Dr. M., and we assumed that even this small addendum would not have got into the dream if it had not been susceptible of a special deprivation. In this way, we arrive at the history of that unfortunate patient to whose bedside I quickly called my older colleague. In the seemingly absurd dream, which treated the difference between 51 and 56 as a quantity negligible, the number 51 was mentioned repeatedly. Instead of regarding this as a matter of course, or a detail of indifferent value, we proceeded from this to a second train of thought in the latent dream content, which led to the number 51, and by following up this clue, we arrived at the fears which proposed fifty-one years as the term of life in the sharpest opposition to a dominant train of thought which was boastfully lavish of the years. In the dream, non vixit, I found as an insignificant interpolation that I had at first overlooked the sentence. As P does not understand him, F L asks me, etc. The interpretation then coming to a standstill, I went back to these words and I found through them the way to the infantile fantasy which appeared in the dream thoughts as an intermediate point of junction. This came about by means of the poet's verses. Seldom have you understood me, seldom have I understood you, but when we found ourselves in the mire, we at once understood each other. Every analysis will afford evidence of the fact that the most insignificant features of the dream are indispensable to interpretation and will show how the completion of the task is delayed if we postpone our examination of them. We have given equal attention in the interpretation of dreams to every nuance of verbal expression found in them. Indeed, whenever we are confronted by a senseless or insufficient wording, as though we had failed to translate the dream into the proper version, we have respected even these defects of expression. In brief, what other writers have regarded as arbitrary improvisations concocted hastily to avoid confusion, we have treated like a sacred text. This contradiction calls for explanation. It would appear, without doing any injustice to the writers in question, that the explanation is in our favor. 
From the standpoint of our newly acquired insight into the origin of dreams, all contradictions are completely reconciled. It is true that we distort the dream in our attempt to reproduce it. We once more find therein what we have called the secondary and often misunderstanding elaboration of the dream by the agency of normal thinking. But this distortion is itself no more than a part of the elaboration to which the dream thoughts are constantly subjected as a result of the dream censorship. Other writers have here suspected or observed that part of the dream distortion, whose work is manifest, but for us this is of little consequence, as we know that a far more extensive work of distortion, not so easily apprehended, has already taken the dream for its object from among the hidden dream thoughts. The only mistake of these writers consists in believing the modification effected in the dream by its recollection and verbal expression to be arbitrary, incapable of further solution, and consequently liable to lead us astray in our cognition of the dream. They underestimate the determination of the dream in the psyche. Here there is nothing arbitrary. It can be shown that in all cases a second train of thought immediately takes over the determination of the elements which have been left undetermined by the first. For example, I wish quite arbitrarily to think of a number, but this is not possible. The number that occurs to me is definitely and necessarily determined by thoughts within me which may be quite foreign to my momentary purpose. The modifications which the dream undergoes in its revision by the waking mind are just as little arbitrary. They preserve an associative connection with the content whose place they take and serve to show us the way to this content which may itself be a substitute for yet another content. In analyzing the dreams of patients, I impose the following test of this assertion, and never without success. If the first report of a dream seems not very comprehensible, I request the dreamer to repeat it. This he rarely does in the same words. But the passages in which the expression is modified are thereby made known to me as the weak points of the dream's disguise. They are what the embroidered emblem on Siegfried's raiment was to Hagen. These are the points from which the analysis may start. The narrator has been admonished by my announcement that I intend to take special pains to solve the dream, and immediately, obedient to the urge of resistance, he protects the weak points of the dream's disguise, replacing a treacherous expression by a less relevant one. He thus calls my attention to the expressions which he has discarded. From the efforts made to guard against the solution of the dream, I can also draw conclusions about the care with which the raiment of the dream has been woven. The writers whom I have mentioned are, however, less justified when they attribute so much importance to the doubt with which our judgment approaches the relation of the dream. For this doubt is not intellectually warranted. Our memory can give no guarantees. But nevertheless, we are compelled to credit its statements far more frequently than is objectively justifiable. Doubt concerning the accurate reproduction of the dream or of individual data of the dream is only another offshoot of the dream censorship that is of resistance to the emergence of the dream thoughts into consciousness. This resistance has not yet exhausted itself by the displacements and substitutions which it has effected, so that it still clings in the form of doubt to what has been allowed to emerge. We can recognize this doubt all the more readily in that it is careful never to attack the intensive elements of the dream, but only the weak and indistinct ones. But we already know what a transvaluation of all the psychic values has taken place between the dream thoughts and the dream. The distortion has been made possible only by devaluation. It constantly manifests itself in this way and sometimes contents itself therewith. If doubt is added to the indistinctness of an element of the dream content, we may, following this indication, recognize in this element a direct offshoot of one of the outlawed dream thoughts. The state of affairs is like that obtaining after a great revolution in one of the republics of antiquity or the Renaissance. The once powerful ruling families of the nobility are now banished. All high posts are filled by upstarts. In the city itself only the poorer and more powerless citizens or the remoter followers of the vanquished party are tolerated. Even the latter do not enjoy the full rights of citizenship. They are watched with suspicion. In our case, instead of suspicion, we have doubt. I must insist, therefore, that in the analysis of a dream, one must emancipate oneself from the whole scale of standards of reliability, and if there is the slightest possibility that this or that may have occurred in the dream, it should be treated as an absolute certainty. Until one has decided to reject all respect for appearances in tracing the dream elements, 
the analysis will remain at a standstill. Disregard of the element concerned has a psychic effect, in the person analyzed, that is nothing in connection with the unwished ideas behind this element will occur to him. This effect is really not self-evident, it would be quite reasonable to say. Whether this or that was contained in the dream, I do not know for certain. But the following ideas happen to occur to me. But no one ever does say so. It is precisely the disturbing effect of doubt in the analysis that permits it to be unmasked as an offshoot and instrument of the psychic resistance. Psychoanalysis is justifiably suspicions. One of its rules runs, whatever disturbs the progress of the work is a resistance. The peremptory statement, whatever disturbs the progress of the work is a resistance, might easily be misunderstood. It has, of course, the significance merely of a technical rule, a warning for the analyst. It is not denied that during an analysis events may occur which cannot be ascribed to the intention of the person analyzed. The patient's father may die in other ways than by being murdered by the patient, or a war may break out and interrupt the analysis. But despite the obvious exaggeration of the above statement, there is still something new and useful in it. Even if the disturbing event is real and independent of the patient, the extent of the disturbing influence does not depend only on him, and the resistance reveals itself unmistakably in the ready and immoderate exploitation of such an opportunity. The forgetting of dreams, too, remains inexplicable, until we seek to explain it by the power of the psychic censorship. The feeling that one has dreamed a great deal during the night, and has retained only a little of it, may have yet another meaning in a number of cases. It may perhaps mean that the dream work has continued in a perceptible manner throughout the night, but has left behind it only one brief dream. There is, however, no possible doubt that a dream is progressively forgotten on waking. One often forgets it in spite of a painful effort to recover it. I believe, however, that just as one generally overestimates the extent of this forgetting, so also one overestimates the lacunae in our knowledge of the dream due to the gaps occurring in it. All the dream content that has been lost by forgetting can often be recovered by analysis. In a number of cases, at all events, it is possible to discover from a single remaining fragment, not the dream, of course, which after all is of no importance, but the whole of the dream thoughts. It requires a greater expenditure of attention and self-suppression in the analysis. That is all. But it shows that the forgetting of the dream is not innocent of hostile intention. A convincing proof of the tendentious nature of dream forgetting, of the fact that it serves the resistance, is obtained on analysis by investigating a preliminary stage of forgetting. It often happens that, in the midst of an interpretation, an omitted fragment of the dream suddenly emerges, which is described as having been previously forgotten. This part of the dream that has been wrested from forgetfulness is always the most important part. It lies in the shortest path to the solution of the dream, and for that every reason it was most exposed to the resistance. Among the examples of dreams that I have included in the text of this treatise, it once happened that I had subsequently to interpolate a fragment of dream content. The dream is a dream of travel, which revenges itself on two unamiable traveling companions. I have left it almost entirely uninterpreted, as part of its content is obscene. The part omitted reads, I said, referring to a book of Schiller's, it is from, but corrected myself as I realized my mistake, it is by, whereupon the man remarked to his sister, yes, he said it correctly. Such corrections in the use of foreign languages are not rare in dreams, but they are usually attributed to foreigners. Maury, while he was studying English, once dreamed that he informed someone that he had called on him the day before in the following words, I called for you yesterday. The other answered correctly, you mean I called on you yesterday. Self-correction in dreams, which to some writers seem so wonderful, does not really call for consideration. But I will draw from my own memory an instance typical of verbal errors in dreams. I was nineteen years of age when I visited England for the first time and I spent a day on the shore of the Irish Sea. Naturally enough, I amused myself by picking up the marine animals left on the beach by the tide, and I was just examining a starfish. The dream begins with Holtern, Holoturian, where a pretty little girl came up to me and asked me, Is it a starfish? Is it alive? I replied, Yes, he is alive, but then felt ashamed of my mistake and repeated the sentence correctly. 
for the grammatical mistake which I then made, the dream substitutes another, which is quite common among German people. Das Buch ist von Schiller is not to be translated by the book is from, but by the book is by. That the dream work accomplishes this substitution, because the word from, according to its consonance with the German adjective from, pious, devout, makes a remarkable condensation possible, should no longer surprise us, after all that we have heard of the intentions of the dream work and its unscrupulous selection of means. But what relation has this harmless recollection of the seashore to my dream? It explains by means of a very innocent example that I have used the word, the word denoting gender, or sex, or the sexual, he, in the wrong place. This is surely one of the keys to the solution of the dream. Those who have heard of the derivation of the book title Matter and Motion, Molière, in La Malade Imaginaire, La Matière et elle Laudable, A Motion of the Bowels, will readily be able to supply the missing parts. Moreover, I can prove conclusively, by a demonstratio ad oculos, that the forgetting of the dream is in a large measure the work of the resistance. A patient tells me that he has dreamed but that the dream has vanished without leaving a trace, as if nothing had happened. We set to work. However, I come upon a resistance which I explain to the patient, encouraging and urging him. I help him to become reconciled to some disagreeable thought, and I have hardly succeeded in doing so, when he exclaims, Now I can recall what I dreamed. The same resistance which that day disturbed him in the work of interpretation caused him also to forget the dream. By overcoming this resistance, I have brought back the dream to his memory. In the same way, the patient, having reached a certain part of the work, may recall a dream which occurred three, four, or more days ago, and which has hitherto remained in oblivion. Psychoanalytical experience has furnished us with yet another proof of the fact that the forgetting of dreams depends far more on the resistance than on the mutually alien character of the waking and sleeping states, as some writers have believed it to depend. It often happens to me, as well as to other analysts and to patients under treatment, that we are waked from sleep by a dream, as we say, and that immediately thereafter, while in full possession of our mental faculties, we begin to interpret the dream. Often in such cases, I have not rested until I have achieved a full understanding of the dream, and yet it has happened that after waking I have forgotten the interpretation work as completely as I have forgotten the dream content itself though I have been aware that I have dreamed and that I have interpreted the dream. The dream has far more frequently taken the result of the interpretation with it into forgetfulness than the intellectual faculty has succeeded in retaining the dream in the memory. But between this work of interpretation and the waking thoughts, there is not that psychic abyss by which other writers have sought to explain the forgetting of dreams. When Morton Prince objects to my explanation of the forgetting of dreams on the ground, that it is only a special case of the amnesia of dissociated psychic states, and that the impossibility of applying my explanation of this special amnesia to other types of amnesia makes it valueless even for its immediate purpose. He reminds the reader that in all his descriptions of such dissociated states, he has never attempted to discover the dynamic explanation underlying these phenomena. For had he done so, he would surely have discovered that repression, and the resistance produced thereby is the cause not of these dissociations merely, but also of the amnesia of their psychic content. The dreams are as little forgotten as other psychic acts, that even in their power of impressing themselves on the memory, they may fairly be compared with the other psychic performances, was proved to me by an experiment which I was able to make while preparing the manuscript of this book. I had preserved in my notes a great many dreams of my own, which, for one reason or another, I could not interpret, or, at the time of dreaming them, could interpret only very imperfectly. In order to maintain the material to illustrate my assertion, I attempted to interpret some of them a year or two later. In this attempt, I was invariably successful. Indeed, I may say that the interpretation was effected more easily after all this time than when the dreams were of recent occurrence. As a possible explanation of this fact, I would suggest that I had overcome many of the internal resistances which had disturbed me at the time of dreaming. In such subsequent interpretations, I have compared the odd yield of dream thoughts with the present result, which has usually been more abundant, and I have invariably found the old dream thoughts unaltered among the present ones. 
However, I soon recovered from my surprise when I reflected that I had long been accustomed to interpret dreams of former years that had occasionally been related to me by my patients as though they had been dreams of the night before, by the same method and with the same success. In the section on anxiety dreams, I shall include two examples of such delayed dream interpretations. When I made this experiment for the first time, I expected, not unreasonably, that dreams would behave in this connection merely like neurotic symptoms. For when I treat a psychoneurotic, for instance, an hysterical patient by psychoanalysis, I am compelled to find explanations for the first symptoms of the malady, which have long since disappeared, as well as for those still existing symptoms which have brought the patient to me. And I find the former problem easier to solve than the more exigent one of today. In the studies in hysteria, published as early as 1895, I was able to give the explanation of a first hysterical attack which the patient, a woman over 40 years of age, had experienced in her 15th year. Dreams which have occurred during the first years of childhood and which have sometimes been retained in the memory for decades with perfect sensorial freshness are almost always of great importance for the understanding of the development and the neurosis of the dreamer. The analysis of them protects the physician from errors and uncertainties which might confuse him, even theoretically. End of section 39. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 40 of the Interpretation of Dreams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud. Translated by A. A. Brill. Section 40. The Forgetting of Dreams, Part 2. I will now make a few rather unsystematic remarks relating to the interpretations of dreams, which will perhaps serve as a guide to the reader who wishes to test my assertions by the analysis of his own dreams. He must not expect that it will be a simple and easy matter to interpret his own dreams. Even the observations of endoptic phenomena and other sensations which are commonly immune from attention call for practice although this group of observations is not opposed by any psychic motive. It is very much more difficult to get hold of the unwished ideas. He who seeks to do so must fulfill the requirements laid down in this treatise, and while following the rules here given, he must endeavor to restrain all criticism, all preconceptions, and all effective or intellectual bias in himself during the work of analysis. He must be ever mindful of the precept which Claude Bernard held up to the experimenter in the physiological laboratory. Travailler comme une bête, that is, he must be as enduring as an animal, and also as disinterested in the results of his work. He who will follow this advice will no longer find the task a difficult one. The interpretation of a dream cannot always be accomplished in one session. After following up a chain of associations, you will often feel that your working capacity is exhausted. The dream will not tell you anything more than day. It is best to break off and to resume the work the following day. Another portion of the dream content then solicits your attention, and you thus obtain access to a fresh stratum of the dream thoughts. One might call this the fractional interpretation of dreams. It is most difficult to induce the beginner in dream interpretation to recognize the fact that his task is not finished when he is in possession of a complete interpretation of the dream which is both ingenious and coherent, and which gives particulars of all the elements of the dream content. Besides this, another interpretation and over-interpretation of the same dream, one which has escaped him, may be possible. It is really not easy to form an idea of the wealth of trains of unconscious thought striving for expression in our minds, or to credit the adroitness displayed by the dream work in killing, so to speak, seven flies at one stroke, like the journeyman tailor in the fairy tale, by means of its ambiguous modes of expression. The reader will constantly be inclined to reproach the author for a superfluous display of ingenuity, but anyone who has had a personal experience of dream interpretation will know better than to do so. On the other hand, one cannot accept the opinion, first expressed by H. Silberer, that every dream, or even that many dreams, and certain groups of dreams, calls for two different interpretations 
between which there is even supposed to be a fixed relation. One of these, which Silberer calls the psychoanalytic interpretation, attributes to the dream any meaning you please, but in the main an infantile, a sexual one. The other, the more important interpretation, which he calls the anagogic interpretation, reveals the more serious and often profound thoughts which the dream work has used as its material. Silberer does not prove this assertion by citing a number of dreams which he has analyzed in these two directions. I am obliged to object to this opinion on the ground that it is contrary to facts. The majority of dreams require no over-interpretation and are especially insusceptible of an anagogic interpretation. The influence of a tendency which seeks to veil the fundamental conditions of dream formation and divert our interests from its instinctual roots is as evident in Silberer's theory as in other theoretical efforts of the last few years. In a number of cases I can confirm Silberer's assertions, but in these the analysis shows me that the dream work was confronted with the task of transforming a series of highly abstract thoughts incapable of direct representation from waking life into a dream. The dream work attempted to accomplish this task by seizing upon another thought material which stood in loose and often allegorical relation to the abstract thoughts and thereby diminished the difficulty of representing them. The abstract interpretation of a dream originating in this manner will be given by the dreamer immediately, but the correct interpretation of the substituted material can be obtained only by means of a familiar technique. The question of whether every dream can be interpreted is to be answered in the negative. One should not forget that in the work of interpretation one is opposed by the psychic forces that are responsible for the distortion of the dream. Whether one can master the inner resistances by one's intellectual interest, one's capacity for self-control, one's psychological knowledge and one's experience in dream interpretation depends on the relative strength of the opposing forces. It is always possible to make some progress. One can at all events go far enough to become convinced that a dream has meaning and generally far enough to gain some idea of its meaning. It very often happens that a second dream enables us to confirm and continue the interpretation assumed for the first. A whole series of dreams, continuing for weeks or months, may have a common basis, and should therefore be interpreted as a continuity. In dreams that follow one another, we often observe that one dream takes as its central point something that is only alluded to in the periphery of the next dream, and conversely, so that even in their interpretations the two supplement each other. The different dreams of the same rite are always to be treated in the work of interpretation as a whole. I have already shown by examples, in the best interpreted dreams, we often have to leave one passage in obscurity, because we observe during the interpretation that we have here a tangle of dream thoughts which cannot be unraveled and which furnishes no fresh contribution to the dream content. This, then, is the keystone of the dream the point at which it ascends into the unknown. For the dream thoughts which we encounter during the interpretation commonly have no termination, but run in all directions into the net-like entanglement of our intellectual world. It is from some denser part of this fabric that the dream wish then arises, like the mushroom from its mycelium. Let us now return to the facts of dream forgetting. So far, of course, we have failed to draw any important conclusion from them. When our waking life shows an unmistakable intention to forget the dream which has been formed during the night, either as a whole, immediately after waking, or little by little in the course of the day, and when we recognize as the chief factor in this process of forgetting the psychic resistance against the dream which has already done its best to oppose the dream at night, the question then arises, what actually has made the dream formation possible against this resistance? Let us consider the most striking case in which the waking life has thrust the dream aside as though it had never happened. If we take into consideration the play of the psychic forces, we are compelled to assert that the dream would never have come into existence had the resistance prevailed at night as it did by day. We conclude, then, that the resistance loses some part of its force during the night. We know that it has not been discontinued, as we have demonstrated its share in the formation of dreams, namely, the work of distortion. We have therefore to consider the possibility that at night the resistance is merely diminished and that dream formation becomes possible because of this slackening of the resistance. And we shall readily understand that as it regains its full power on waking, it immediately thrusts aside what it was forced to admit while it was feeble. 
descriptive psychology teaches us that the chief determinant of dream formation is the dormant state of the psyche, and we may now add the following explanation. The state of sleep makes dream formation possible by reducing the endopsychic censorship. We are certainly tempted to look upon this as the only possible conclusion to be drawn from the facts of dream forgetting, and to develop from this conclusion further deductions as to the comparative energy operative in the sleeping and waking states. We shall stop here for the present. When we have penetrated a little farther into the psychology of dreams, we shall find that the origin of dream formation may be differently conceived. The resistance which tends to prevent the dream thoughts from becoming conscious may perhaps be evaded without suffering reduction. It is also plausible that both the factors which favor dream formation, the reduction as well as the evasion of the resistance, may be simultaneously made possible by the sleeping state. But we shall pause here and resume the subject a little later. We must now consider another series of objections against our procedure in dream interpretation. For we proceed by dropping all the directing ideas which at other times control reflection, directing our attention to a single element of the dream, noting the involuntary thoughts that associate themselves with this element. We then take up the next component of the dream content and repeat the operation with this, and regardless of the direction taken by the thoughts, we allow ourselves to be led onwards by them, rambling from one subject to another. At the same time, we harbor the confident hope that we may in the end, and without intervention on our part, come upon the dream thoughts from which the dream originated. To this, the critic may make the following objection. That we arrived somewhere if we start from a single element of the dream is not remarkable. Something can be associatively connected with every idea. The only thing that is remarkable is that one should succeed in hitting upon the dream thoughts in this arbitrary and aimless excursion. It is probably a self-deception. The investigator follows the chain of associations from the one element which is taken up until he finds the chain breaking off, whereupon he takes up a second element. It is thus only natural that the originally unconfined associations should now become narrowed down. He has the former chain of associations still in mind, and will therefore, in the analysis of the second dream idea, hit all the more readily upon single associations which have something in common with the associations of the first chain. He then imagines that he has found a thought which represents a point of junction between two of the dream elements, as he allows himself all possible freedom of thought connection, accepting only the transitions from one idea to another which occur in normal thinking. It is not difficult for him finally to concoct out of a series of intermediary thoughts something which he calls the dream thoughts, and without any guarantee, since they are otherwise unknown. He palms these off as a psychic equivalent of the dream. But all this is a purely arbitrary procedure, an ingenious-looking exploitation of chance, and anyone who will go to this useless trouble can in this way work out any desired interpretation for any dream whatever. If such objections are really advanced against us, we may in defense refer to the impression produced by our dream interpretations, the surprising connections with other dream elements which appear while we are following up the individual ideas, and the improbability that anything which so perfectly covers and explains the dream as do our dream interpretations could be achieved otherwise than by following previously established psychic connections. We might also point to the fact that that the procedure in dream interpretation is identical with the procedure followed in the resolution of hysterical symptoms, where the correctness of the dream is attested by the emergence and disappearance of the symptoms, that is, where the interpretation of the text is confirmed by the interpolated illustrations. We have no reason to avoid this problem, namely, how one can arrive at a pre-existent aim by following an arbitrarily and aimlessly maundering chain of thoughts, since we shall be able not to solve the problem, it is true, but to get rid of it entirely. For it is demonstrably incorrect to state that we abandon ourselves to an aimless excursion of thought when, as in the interpretation of dreams, we renounce reflection and allow the involuntary ideas to come to the surface. It can be shown that we are able to reject only those directing ideas which are known to us, and that with the cessation of these the unknown or as we inexactly say, unconscious directing ideas immediately exert their influence and henceforth determine the flow of the involuntary ideas. Thinking without directing ideas cannot be ensured by any influence we ourselves exert on our own psychic life. 
Neither do I know of any state of psychic derangement in which such a mode of thought establishes itself. The psychiatrists have here far too prematurely relinquished the idea of the solidity of the psychic structure. I know that an unregulated stream of thoughts, devoid of directing ideas, can occur as little in the realm of hysteria and paranoia as in the formation or solution of dreams. Perhaps it does not occur at all in the endogenous psychic affections, and, according to the ingenious hypothesis of Loret, even the deliria observed in confused psychic states have meaning, and are incomprehensible to us only because of omissions. I have had the same conviction whenever I have had an opportunity of observing such states. The deliria are the work of a censorship which no longer makes any effort to conceal its sway, which instead of lending its support to a revision that is no longer obnoxious to it, cancels regardlessly anything to which it objects, thus causing the remnant to appear disconnected. This censorship proceeds like the Russian censorship on the frontier, which allows only those foreign journals which have had certain passages blacked out to fall into the bands of the readers to be protected. Edward von Hartmann clearly enunciated the law of association of ideas which is directed by unconscious directing ideas without, however, realizing the scope of this law. With him, it was a question of demonstrating that every combination of a sensuous idea, when it is not left entirely to chance, but is directed to a definite end, is in need of help from the unconscious, and that the conscious interest in any particular thought association is a stimulus for the unconscious to discover from among the numberless possible ideas the one which corresponds to the directing idea. It is the unconscious that selects, and appropriately, in accordance with the aims of the interest, and this holds true for the associations in abstract thinking, as sensible representations and artistic combinations, as well as for flashes of wit. Hence, a limiting of the association of ideas to ideas that evoke and are evoked in the sense of pure association psychology is untenable. Such a restriction would be justified only if there were states in human life in which man was free not only from any conscious purpose, but also from the domination or cooperation of any unconscious interest, any passing mood. But such a state hardly ever comes to pass, for even if one leaves one strain of thought seemingly altogether to chance, or if one surrenders oneself entirely to the involuntary dreams of fantasy, yet always other leading interests, dominant feelings and moods prevail at one time rather than another, and these will always exert an influence on the association of ideas. In semi-conscious dreams, there always appear only such ideas as correspond to the unconscious momentary main interest. By rendering prominent the feelings and moods over the free thought series, the methodical procedure of psychoanalysis is thoroughly justified, even from the standpoint of Hartmann's psychology. Duprel concludes from the fact that a name which we vainly try to recall suddenly occurs to the mind that there is an unconscious but nonetheless purposeful thinking, whose result then appears in consciousness. The free play of ideas following any chain of associations may perhaps occur in cases of destructive organic affections of the brain. What, however, is taken to be such in the psychoneuroses may always be explained as the influence of the censorship on a series of thoughts which have been pushed into the foreground by the concealed directing ideas. It has been considered an unmistakable sign of free association, unencumbered by directing ideas, if emerging ideas or images appear to be connected by means of the so-called superficial associations, that is, by assonance, verbal ambiguity, and temporal coincidence, without inner relationship of meaning. In other words, if they are all connected by all those associations which we allow ourselves to exploit in wit and playing upon words. This distinguishing mark holds good with associations which lead us from the elements of the dream content to the intermediary thoughts, and from these to the dream thoughts proper. In many analyses of dreams, we have found surprising examples of this. In these, no connections was too loose and no witticism too objectionable to serve as a bridge from one thought to another. But the correct understanding of such surprising tolerance is not far to seek. Whenever one psychic element is connected with another by an obnoxious and superficial association, there exists also a correct and more profound connection between the two, which succumbs to the resistance of the censorship. 
the correct explanation for the predominance of the superficial associations is the pressure of the censorship and not the suppression of the directing ideas. Whenever the censorship renders the normal connective parts impassable, the superficial associations will replace the deeper ones in the representation. It is as though in a mountainous region a general interruption of traffic, for example an inundation, should render the broad highways impassable. Traffic would then have to be maintained by steep and inconvenient tracks used at other times only by the hunter. We can here distinguish two cases, which, however, are essentially one. In the first case, the censorship is directed only against the connection of two thoughts, which, being detached from one another, escape its opposition. The two thoughts then enter successively into consciousness. Their connection remains concealed. But in its place there occurs to us a superficial connection between the two which would not otherwise have occurred to us, and which as a rule connects with another angle of the conceptual complex instead of that from which the suppressed but essential connection proceeds. Or in the second case, both thoughts owing to their content succumb to the censorship. Both then appear not in their correct form, but in a modified, substituted form, and both substituted thoughts are so selected as to represent by a superficial association the essential relation which existed between those that they have replaced. Under the pressure of the censorship, the displacement of a normal and vital association by one superficial and apparently absurd has thus occurred in both cases. Because we know of these displacements, we unhesitatingly rely upon even the superficial associations which occur in the course of dream interpretation. The psychoanalysis of neurotics makes abundant use of the two principles, that with the abandonment of the conscious directing ideas, the control over the flow of ideas is transferred to the concealed directing ideas, and that superficial associations are only a displacement substitute for suppressed and more profound ones. Indeed, psychoanalysis makes these two principles the foundation stones of its techniques. When I request a patient to dismiss all reflection, and to report to me whatever comes into his mind, I firmly cling to the assumption that he will not be able to drop the directing idea of the treatment, and I feel justified in concluding that what he reports, even though it may seem to be quite ingenuous and arbitrary, has some connection with his morbid state. Another directing idea of which the patient has no suspicion is my own personality. The full appreciation as well as the detailed proof of both these explanations belongs to the description of the psychoanalytic technique as a therapeutic method. We have here reached one of the junctions, so to speak, at which we purposely drop the subject of dream interpretation. Of all the objections raised, only one is justified and still remains to be met, namely, that we ought not to ascribe all the associations of the interpretation work to the nocturnal dream work. By interpretation in the waking state, we are actually opening a path running back from the dream elements to the dream thoughts. The dream work has followed the contrary direction, and it is not at all probable that these paths are equally possible in opposite directions. On the contrary, it appears that during the day, by means of new thought connections, we sink shafts that strike the intermediary thoughts and the dream thoughts now in this place, now in that. We can see how the recent thought material of the day forces its way into the interpretation series, and how the additional resistance which has appeared since the night probably compels it to make new and further detours. But the number and form of the collaterals which we thus contrive during the day are, psychologically speaking, indifferent, so long as they point the way to the dream thoughts we are seeking. End of section 40. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 41 of The Interpretation of Dreams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud Translated by A. A. Brill Regression Now that we have defended ourselves against the objections raised, or have at least indicated our weapons of defense, we must no longer delay entering upon the psychological investigations for which we have so long been preparing. 
let us summarize the main results of our recent investigations. The dream is a psychic act full of import. Its motive power is invariably a wish craving fulfillment. The fact that it is unrecognizable as a wish and its many peculiarities and absurdities are due to the influence of the psychic censorship to which it has been subjected during its formation. Besides the necessity of evading the censorship, the following factors have played a part in its formation. First, a need for condensing the psychic material. Second, regarding for representability in sensory images. And third, though not constantly, regard for a rational and intelligible exterior of the dream structure. From each of these propositions, a path leads onwards to psychological postulates and assumptions. Thus, the reciprocal relation of the wish motives and the four conditions, as well as the mutual relations of these conditions, must now be investigated. The dream must be inserted in the context of the psychic life. At the beginning of this section, we cited a certain dream in order that it might remind us of the problems that are still unsolved. The interpretation of this dream, of the burning child, presented no difficulties, although in the analytical sense it was not given in full. We asked ourselves why, after all, it was necessary that the father should dream instead of waking, and we recognized the wish to represent the child as living as a motive of the dream. That there was yet another wish operative in the dream we shall be able to show after further discussion. For the present, however, we may say that for the sake of the wish fulfillment, the thought process of sleep was transformed into a dream. If the wish fulfillment is cancelled out, only one characteristic remains which distinguishes the two kinds of psychic events. The dream thought would have been, I see a glimmer coming from the room in which the body is lying. Perhaps a candle has fallen over and the child is burning. The dream reproduces the result of this reflection unchanged, but represents it in a situation which exists in the present and is perceptible by the senses like an experience of the waking state. This, however, is the most common and the most striking psychological characteristic of the dream. A thought, usually the one wished for, is objectified in the dream and represented as a scene or, as we think, experienced. But how are we now to explain this characteristic peculiarity of the dream work? Or, to put it more modestly, how are we to bring it into relation with the psychic processes? On closer examination, it is plainly evident that the manifest form of the dream is marked by two characteristics which are almost independent of each other. One is its representation as a present situation with the omission of perhaps the other is the translation of the thought into visual images and speech. The transformation to which the dream thoughts are subjected, because the expectation is put into the present tense, is perhaps in this particular dream not so very striking. This is probably due to the special and really subsidiary role of the wish fulfillment in this dream. Let us take another dream, in which the dream wish does not break away from the continuation of the waking thoughts in sleep. For example, the dream of Irma's injection. Here the dream thought achieving representation is in the conditional. If only Otto could be blamed for Irma's illness. The dream suppresses the conditional and replaces it by a simple present tense. Yes, Otto is to blame for Irma's illness. This, then, is the first of the transformations which even the undistorted dream imposes on the dream thoughts but we will not linger over the first peculiarity of the dream. We dispose of it by a reference to the conscious fantasy, the daydream, which behaves in a similar fashion with its conceptual content. When Daudet's Monsieur Joyeuse wanders unemployed through the streets of Paris while his daughter is led to believe that he has a post and is sitting in his office, he dreams in the present tense of circumstances that might help him to obtain a recommendation and employment. The dream then employs the present tense in the same manner, and with the same right as the daydream. The present is the tense in which the wish is represented as fulfilled. The second quality, peculiar to the dream alone, as distinguished from the daydream, is that the conceptual content is not thought, but is transformed into visual images to which we give credence and which we believe that we experience. Let us add, however, that not all dreams show this transformation of ideas into visual images. 
There are dreams which consist solely of thoughts, but we cannot on that account deny that they are substantially dreams. My dream, Autodidasca, the day fantasy about Professor N, is of this character. It is almost as free of visual elements as though I have thought its content during the day. Moreover, every long dream contains elements which have not undergone this transformation into the visual and which are simply thought or known as we are wont to think or know in our waking state. And we must here reflect that this transformation of ideas into visual images does not occur in dreams alone, but also in hallucinations and visions, which may appear spontaneously in health or as symptoms in the psychoneuroses. In brief, the relation which we are here investigating is by no means an exclusive one. The fact remains, however, that this characteristic of the dream, whenever it occurs, seems to be its most noteworthy characteristic, so that we cannot think of the dream life without it. To understand it, however, requires a very exhaustive discussion. Among all the observations relating to the theory of dreams is to be found in the literature of the subject. I should like to lay stress upon one as being particularly worthy of mention. The famous G. T. H. Fechner makes the conjecture in a discussion as to the nature of the dreams, that the dream is staged elsewhere than in the waking ideation. No other assumption enables us to comprehend the special peculiarities of the dream life. The idea which is thus put before us is one of psychic locality. We shall wholly ignore the fact that the psychic apparatus concerned is known to us only as an anatomical preparation, and we shall carefully avoid the temptation to determine the psychic locality in any anatomical sense. We shall remain on psychological ground and we shall do no more than accept the invitation to think of the instrument which serves the psychic activities, much as we think of a compound microscope, a photographic camera, or other apparatus. The psychic locality, then, corresponds to a place within such an apparatus in which one of the preliminary phases of the image comes into existence. As is well known, there are in the microscope and the telescope such ideal localities or planes in which no tangible portion of the apparatus is located. I think it superfluous to apologize for the imperfections of this and all similar figures. These comparisons are designed only to assist us in our attempt to make intelligible the complication of the psychic performance by dissecting it and referring the individual performances to the individual components of the apparatus. So far as I am aware, no attempt has yet been made to divine the construction of the psychic instrument by means of such dissection. I see no harm in such an attempt. I think that we should give free rein to our conjectures, provided we keep our heads and do not mistake the scaffolding for the building. Since for the first approach to any unknown subject, we need the help only of auxiliary ideas, we shall prefer the crudest and most tangible hypothesis to all others. Accordingly, we conceive the psychic apparatus as a compound instrument, the component parts of which we shall call instances, or, for the sake of clearness, systems. We shall then anticipate that these systems may perhaps maintain a constant spatial orientation to one another, very much as do the different and successive systems of lenses of a telescope. Strictly speaking, there is no need to assume an actual spatial arrangement of the psychic system. It will be enough for our purpose if a definite sequence is established, so that in certain psychic events the system will be traversed by the excitation in a definite temporal order. This order may be different in the case of other processes. Such a possibility is left open. For the sake of brevity, we shall henceforth speak of the component parts of the apparatus as psi systems. The first thing that strikes us is the fact that the apparatus composed of psi systems has a direction. All our psychic activities proceed from inner or outer stimuli and terminate in innovations. We thus ascribe to the apparatus a sensory and a motor end, at the sensory end, we find a system which receives the perceptions, and at the motor end, another which opens the sluices of motility. The psychic process generally runs from the perceptive end to the motor end, but this is only in compliance with the requirement, long familiar to us, that the psychic apparatus must be constructed like a reflex apparatus. The reflex act remains the type of every psychic activity as well. We now have reason to admit a first differentiation at the sensory end. The percepts that come to us leave in our psychic apparatus a trace, which we may call a memory trace. The function related to this memory trace we call the memory. 
If we hold seriously to our resolution to connect the psychic processes into systems, the memory trace can consist only of lasting charges in the elements of the systems. But, as has already been shown elsewhere, obvious difficulties arise when one and the same system is faithfully to preserve changes in its elements and still to remain fresh and receptive in respect of new occasions of change. In accordance with the principle which is directing our attempt, we shall therefore ascribe these two functions to two different systems. We assume that an initial system of this apparatus receives the stimuli of perception, but retains nothing of them. That is, it has no memory, and that behind this there lies a second system, which transforms the momentary excitation of the first into lasting traces. The following would then be the diagram of our psychic apparatus. We know that of the percepts which act upon the peace system, we retain permanently something else as well as the content itself. Our percepts prove also to be connected with one another in the memory, and this is especially so if they originally occurred simultaneously. We call this the fact of association. It is now clear that, if the peace system is entirely lacking in memory, it certainly cannot preserve traces for the associations, the individual P elements would be intolerably hindered in their functioning if a residue of a former connection should make its influence felt against a new perception. Hence, we must rather assume that the memory system is the basis of association. The fact of association then consists in this, that in consequence of a lessening of resistance and a smoothing of the ways from one of the mem elements, the excitation transmits itself to a second rather than to a third mem element. On further investigation, we find it necessary to assume not one, but many such mem systems in which the same excitation transmitted by the P elements undergoes a diversified fixation. The first of these MEM systems will in any case contain the fixation of the association through simultaneity, while those in lying farther away, the same material of excitation will be arranged according to other forms of combination, so that relationships of similarity, etc., might perhaps be represented by these later systems. It would, of course, be idle to attempt to express in words the psychic significance of such a system. Its characteristic would lie in the intimacy of its relations to elements of raw material of memory, that is, if we wish to hint at a more comprehensive theory, in the gradations of the conductive resistance on the way to these elements. An observation of a general nature, which may possibly point to something of importance, may here be interpolated. The P system, which possesses no capacity for preserving changes, and hence no memory, furnishes to consciousness the complexity and variety of the sensory qualities. Our memories, on the other hand, are unconscious in themselves. Those that are most deeply impressed form no exception. They can be made conscious, but there is no doubt that they unfold all their activities in the unconscious state. What we term our character is based indeed on the memory traces of our impressions and it is precisely those impressions that have affected us most strongly, those of our early youth which hardly ever became conscious. But when memories become conscious again, they show no sensory quality, or a very negligible one in comparison with the perceptions. If now it can be confirmed that for consciousness, memory and quality are mutually exclusive in the psi systems, we have gained a most promising insight into the determinations of the neuron excitations. What we have so far assumed concerning the composition of the psychic apparatus at the sensible end has been assumed regardless of dreams and of the psychological explanations which we have hitherto derived from them. Dreams, however, will serve as a source of evidence for our knowledge of another part of the apparatus. We have seen that it was possible to explain dream formation unless we ventured to assume two psychic instances, one of which subjected the activities of the other to criticism the result of which was exclusion from consciousness. We have concluded that the criticizing instance maintains closer relations with the consciousness than the instance criticized. It stands between the latter and the consciousness like a screen. Further, we have found that there is a reason to identify the criticizing instance with that which directs our waking life and determines our voluntary conscious activities. If, in accordance with our assumptions, we now replace these instances by systems, the criticizing system will therefore be moved to the motor end. We now enter both the systems in our diagram, expressing, by the names given them, their relation to consciousness. The last of the systems at the motor end we call the preconscious species. 
to denote that the exciting processes in this system can reach consciousness without any further detention, provided certain other conditions are fulfilled. For example, the attainment of a definite degree of intensity, a certain apportionment of that function which we must call attention, etc. This is at the same time the system which holds the keys of voluntary motility. The system behind it we call the unconscious, UCs, because it has no access to consciousness except through the preconscious, in the passage through which the excitation process must submit to certain changes. In which of these systems, then, do we localize the impetus to dream formation? For the sake of simplicity, let us say in the system you seize, we shall find, it is true, in subsequent discussions, that this is not altogether correct, that dream formation is obliged to make connection with dream thoughts which belong to the system of the preconscious. But we shall learn elsewhere, when we come to deal with the dream wish, that the motive power of the dream is furnished by the UCs, and on account of this factor, we shall assume the unconscious system as a starting point for dream formation. The dream excitation, like all other thought structures, will now strive to continue itself in the PCs, and thence to gain admission to the consciousness. Experience teaches us that the path leading through the pre-conscious to consciousness is closed to the dream thoughts during the day by the resisting censorship. At night they gain admission to consciousness. The question arises, in what way and because of what changes? If this admission were rendered possible to the dream thoughts by the weakening during the night of the resistance watching on the boundary between the unconscious and the preconscious, we should then have dreams in the material of our ideas, which would not display the hallucinatory character that interests us at present. The weakening of the censorship between the two systems, UCs and PCs, can explain to us only such dreams as the autodidasca dream, but not dreams like that of the burning child which, as will be remembered, we stated as a problem at the outset of our present investigations. What takes place in the hallucinatory dream we can describe in no other way than by saying that the excitation follows a retrogressive course. It communicates itself not to the motor end of the apparatus, but to the sensory end, and finally reaches a system of perception. If we call the direction which the psychic process follows from the unconscious into the waking state progressive, we may then speak of the dream as having a regressive character. This regression is therefore assuredly one of the most important psychological peculiarities of the dream process. But we must not forget that it is not characteristic of the dream alone. Intentional recollection and other component processes of our normal thinking likewise necessitate a retrogression in the psychic apparatus from some complex act of ideation to the raw material of the memory traces which underlie it. But during the waking state, this turning backwards does not reach beyond the memory images. It is incapable of producing the hallucinatory revival of the perceptual images. Why is it otherwise in dreams? When we spoke of the condensation work of the dream, we could not avoid the assumption that by the dream work, the intensities adhering to the ideas are completely transferred from one to another. It is probably this modification of the usual psychic process which makes possible the cathexis of the system of P to its full sensory vividness in the reverse direction to thinking. I hope that we are not deluding ourselves as regards the importance of this present discussion. We have nothing more than give a name to an inexplicable phenomenon. We call it regression, if the idea in the dream is changed back into the visual image from which it once originated. But even this step requires justification. Why this definition if it does not teach us anything new? Well, I believe that the word regression is of service to us, inasmuch as it connects a fact familiar to us with the scheme of the psychic apparatus endowed with direction. At this point, and for the first time, we shall profit by the fact that we have constructed such a scheme. For, with the help of this scheme, we shall perceive, without further reflection, another peculiarity of dream formation. If we look upon the dream as a process of regression within the hypothetical psychic apparatus, we have at once an explanation of the empirically proven fact that all thought relations of the dream thoughts are either lost in the dream work or have difficulty in achieving expression. According to our scheme, these thought relations are contained not in the first mem systems, but in those lying farther to the front, and in the regression to the perceptual images they must forfeit expression. In regression, the structure of the dream thoughts break up into its raw material. 
But what change renders possible this regression which is impossible during the day? Let us here be content with an assumption. There must evidently be charges in the cathexis of the individual systems, causing the latter to become more accessible or inaccessible to the discharge of the excitation. But in any such apparatus, the same effect upon the course of the excitation might be produced by more than one kind of change. We naturally think of the sleeping state and of the many cathetic changes which this evokes at the sensory end of the apparatus. During the day, there is a continuous stream flowing from the size system of the pea toward the motility end. This current ceases at night and can no longer block the flow of the current of excitation in the opposite direction. This would appear to be that seclusion from the outer world which, according to the theory of some writers, is supposed to explain the psychological character of the dream. In the explanation of the regression of the dream, we shall, however, have to take into account those other regressions which occur during morbid waking states. In these other forms of regression, the explanation just given plainly leaves us in the lurch. Regression occurs in spite of the uninterrupted sensory current in a progressive direction. The hallucinations of hysteria and paranoia, as well as the visions of mentally normal persons, I would explain as corresponding, in fact, to regressions, that is, to thoughts transformed into images, and would assert that only such thoughts undergo this transformation as are in intimate connection with suppressed memories, or with memories which have remained unconscious. As an example, I will cite the case of one of my youngest hysterical patients, a boy of twelve, who was prevented from falling asleep by green faces with red eyes, which terrified him. The source of this manifestation was a suppressed but once conscious memory of a boy whom he had often seen four years earlier, and who offered a warning example of many bad habits, including masturbation, for which he was now reproaching himself. At that time his mother had noticed that the complexion of this ill-mannered boy was greenish, and that he had red, that is, red-rimmed eyes. Hence this terrifying vision, which merely determined his recollection of another saying of his mother's, to the effect that such boys become demented, are unable to learn anything at school, and are doomed to an early death. A part of this prediction came true in the case of my little patient. He could not get on at school, and as appeared from his involuntary associations, he was in terrible dread of the remainder of the prophecy. However, after a brief period of successful treatment, his sleep was restored, his anxiety removed, and he finished his scholastic year with an excellent record. Here I may add the interpretation of a vision described to me by an hysterical woman of forty, as having occurred when she was in normal health. One morning she opened her eyes and saw her brother in the room, although she knew him to be confined in an insane asylum. Her little son was asleep by her side. Lest the child should be frightened on seeing his uncle and fall into convulsions, she pulled the sheet over his face. This done, the phantom disappeared. This apparition was a revision of one of her childish memories, which, although conscious, was most intimately connected with all the unconscious material in her mind. Her nursery maid had told her that her mother, who had died young, my patient was then only eighteen months old, had suffered from epileptic or hysterical convulsions, which dated back to a fright caused by her brother, the patient's uncle, who appeared to her disguised as a spectre with a sheet over his head. The vision contains the same elements as the reminiscences, viz. the appearance of the brother, the sheet, the fright, and its effect. These elements, however, are arranged in a fresh context and are transferred to other persons. The obvious motive of the vision and the thought which it replaced were her solicitude lest her little son, who bore a striking resemblance to his uncle, should share the latter's fate. Both examples here cited are not entirely unrelated to the state of sleep, and may for that reason be unfitted to afford the evidence for the sake of which I have cited them. I will therefore refer to my analysis of an hallucinatory paranoid woman patient and to the results of my hitherto unpublished studies on the psychology of the psychoneuroses, in order to emphasize the fact that that in these cases of regressive thought transformation, one must not overlook the influence of a suppressed memory, or one that has remained unconscious, this being usually of an infantile character. This memory draws into the regression, as it were, the thoughts with which it is connected, and which are kept from expression by the censorship, that is, into that form of representation in which the memory itself is psychically existent. And here I may add, as a result of my studies of hysteria, 
that if one succeeds in bringing to consciousness infantile scenes, whether they are recollections or fantasies, they appear as hallucinations and are divested of this character only when they are communicated. It is known also that even in persons whose memories are not otherwise visual, the earliest infantile memories remain vividly visual until late in life. If now we bear in mind the part played in the dream thoughts by the infantile experiences or by the fantasies based upon them, and recollect how often fragments of these re-emerge in the dream content, and how even the dream wishes often proceed from them, we cannot deny the probability that in dreams, too, the transformation of thoughts into visual images may be the result of the attraction exercised by the visually represented memory striving for resuscitation, upon the thoughts severed from the consciousness and struggling for expression. Pursuing this conception, we may further describe the dream as a substitute for the infantile scene modified by transference to recent material. The infantile scene cannot enforce its own revival and must therefore be satisfied to return as a dream. This reference to the significance of the infantile scenes or of their fantastic repetitions as in a certain degree furnishing the pattern for the dream content renders superfluous the assumption made by Schoener and his pupils concerning inner sources of stimuli. Schoener assumes a state of visual excitation, of internal excitation in the organ of sight, when the dreams manifest a special vividness or an extraordinary abundance of visual elements. We need raise no objection to this assumption. We may perhaps content ourselves with assuming such a state of excitation only for the psychic perceptive system of the organ of vision. We shall, however, insist that this state of excitation is a reanimation by the memory of a former actual visual excitation. I cannot from my own experience give a good example showing such an influence of an infantile memory. My own dreams are altogether less rich in perceptual elements than I imagine those of others to be. But in my most beautiful and most vivid dream of late years, I can easily trace the hallucinatory distinctness of the dream contents to the visual qualities of recently received impressions. In Chapter 6, H, I mentioned a dream in which the dark blue of the water, the brown of the smoke issuing from the ship's funnels, and the somber brown and red of the buildings which I saw made a profound and lasting impression upon my mind. This dream, if any, must be attributed to visual excitation. But what was it that had brought my organ of vision into this excitable state? It was a recent impression which has joined itself to a series of former impressions. The colors I beheld were in the first place those of the toy blocks with which my children had erected a magnificent building for my admiration on the day preceding the dream. There was the somber red on the large blocks, the blue and brown on the small ones. Joined to these were the color impressions of my last journey in Italy, the beautiful blue of the Isonzo and the lagoons, the brown hues of the Alps. The beautiful colors seen in the dream were but a repetition of those seen in memory. Let us summarize what we have learned about this peculiarity of dreams, their power of recasting their idea content in visual images. We may not have explained this character of the dream work by referring it to the known laws of psychology, but we have singled it out as pointing to unknown relations and have given it the name of the regressive character. Wherever such regression has occurred, we have regarded it as an effect of the resistance which opposes the progress of thought on its normal way to consciousness, and of the simultaneous attraction exerted upon it by vivid memories. The regression in dreams is perhaps facilitated by the cessation of the progressive stream flowing from the sense organs during the day, for which auxiliary factor there must be some compensation, in other forms of regression, by the strengthening of the other regressive motives. We must also bear in mind that in pathological cases of regression, just as in dreams, the process of energy transference must be different from that occurring in the regressions of normal psychic life, since it renders possible a full hallucinatory cathexis of the perceptive system. What we have described in the analysis of the dream work as regard for representability may be referred to the selective attraction of visually remembered scenes touched by the dream thoughts. As to the regression, we may further observe that it plays a no less important part in the theory of neurotic symptom formation than in the theory of dreams. We may therefore distinguish a threefold species of regression, a, a topical one, in the sense of the scheme of the psi systems here expounded, b, a temporal one, in so far as it is a regression to older psychic formations, and c, a formal one, 
when primitive modes of expression and representation take the place of the customary modes. These three forms of regression are, however, basically one, and in the majority of cases they coincide, for that which is older in point of time is at the same time formally primitive, and in the psychic topography nearer to the perception end. We cannot leave the theme of regression in dreams without giving utterance to an impression which has already and repeatedly forced itself upon us, and which will return to us reinforced after a deeper study of the psychoneuroses, namely, that dreaming is on the whole an act of regression to the earliest relationships of the dreamer, a resuscitation of his childhood, of the impulses which were then dominant, and the modes of expression which were then available. Behind this childhood of the individual, we are then promised an insight into the phylogenetic childhood, into the evolution of the human race, of which the development of the individual is only an abridged repetition influenced by the fortuitous circumstances of life. We begin to suspect that Friedrich Nietzsche was right when he said that in a dream there persists a primordial part of humanity, which we can no longer reach by a direct path, and we are encouraged to expect from the analysis of dreams a knowledge of the archaic inheritance of man, a knowledge of psychical things in him that are innate. It would seem that dreams and neuroses have preserved for us more of the psychical antiquities than we suspected so that psychoanalysis may claim a high rank among those sciences which endeavor to reconstruct the oldest and darkest phases of the beginnings of mankind. It is quite possible that we shall not find this part of our psychological evaluation of dreams particularly satisfying. We must, however, console ourselves with the thought that we are, after all, compelled to build out into the dark. If we have not gone altogether astray, we shall surely reach approximately the same place from another starting point, and then perhaps we shall be better able to find our bearings. End of section 41. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 42 of The Interpretation of Dreams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud. Translated by A. A. Brill. Section 42. The Wish Fulfillment. Part 1. The dream of the burning child cited above affords us a welcome opportunity for appreciating the difficulties confronting the theory of wish fulfillment. That a dream should be nothing but a wish fulfillment must undoubtedly seem strange to us all, and not only because of the contradiction offered by the anxiety dream. Once our first analyses had given us the enlightenment that meaning and psychic value are concealed behind our dreams, we could hardly have expected so unitary a determination of this meaning. According to the correct but summary definition of Aristotle, the dream is a continuation of thinking in sleep. Now if, during the day, our thoughts perform such a diversity of psychic acts, judgments, conclusions, to answering of objections, expectations, intentions, etc., why should they be forced at night to confine themselves to the production of wishes only? Are there not, on the contrary, many dreams that present an altogether different psychic act in dream form, for example, anxious care, and is not the father's unusually transparent dream of the burning child such a dream? From the gleam of light that falls upon his eyes while he is asleep, the father draws the apprehensive conclusion that a candle has fallen over and may be burning the body. He transforms this conclusion into a dream by embodying it in an obvious situation enacted in the present tense. What part is played in this dream by the wish fulfillment? And how can we possibly mistake the predominance of the thought continued from the waking state or evoked by the new sensory impression? All these considerations are justified and force us to look more closely into the role of the wish fulfillment in dreams and the significance of the waking thoughts continued in sleep. It is precisely the wish fulfillment that has already caused us to divide all dreams into two groups. We have found dreams that were plainly wish fulfillments, and others in which the wish fulfillment was unrecognizable and was often concealed by every available means. In this latter class of dreams, we recognize the influence of the dream censorship. 
the undisguised wish dreams were found chiefly in children. Short, frank wish dreams seemed, I purposely emphasized this word, to occur also in adults. We may now ask whence in each case does the wish that is realized in the dream originate. But to what opposition or to what diversity do we relate this whence? I think to the opposition between conscious daily life and an unconscious psychic activity which is able to make itself perceptible only at night. I thus find a threefold possibility for the origin of a wish. Firstly, it may have been excited during the day and owing to external circumstances may have remained unsatisfied. There is thus left for the night an acknowledged and unsatisfied wish. Secondly, it may have emerged during the day, only to be rejected. There is thus left for the night an unsatisfied but suppressed wish. Thirdly, it may have no relation to daily life, but may belong to those wishes which awake only at night, out of the suppressed material in us. If we turn to our scheme of the psychic apparatus, we can localize a wish of the first order in the system PCs. We may assume that a wish of the second order has been forced back from the PC's system into the UC's system, where alone, if anywhere, can it maintain itself. As for the wish impulse of the third order, we believe that it is wholly incapable of leaving the UC's system. Now have the wishes arisen from these different sources the same value for the dream, the same power to incite a dream. On surveying the dreams at our disposal with a view to answering this question, we are at once moved to add as a fourth source of the dream wish the actual wish impetus which arises during the night. For example, the stimulus of thirst and sexual desire. It then seems to us probable that the source of the dream wish does not affect its capacity to incite a dream. I have in mind the dream of the child who continued the voyage that had been interrupted during the day and the other children's dreams cited in the same chapter. They are explained by an unfulfilled but unsuppressed wish of the daytime. That wishes suppressed during the day assert themselves in dreams is shown by a great many examples. I will mention a very simple dream of this kind. A rather sarcastic lady, whose younger friend had become engaged to be married, is asked in the daytime by her acquaintance whether she knows her friend's fiancé and what she thinks of him. She replies with unqualified praise, imposing silence on her own judgment, although she would have liked to tell the truth, namely, that he is a commonplace fellow, one meets such by the dozen. Dudzen Mensch The following night she dreams that the same question is put to her, and that she replies with a formula. In case of subsequent orders, it will suffice to mention the reference number. Finally, as a result of numerous analyses, we find that the wish in all dreams that have been subject to a distortion has its origin in the unconscious and could not become perceptible by day. At first sight, then, it seems that in respect of dream formation, all wishes are of equal value and equal power. I cannot prove here that it is not really the true state of affairs, but I am strongly inclined to assume a stricter determination of the dream wish. Children's dreams leave us in no doubt that a wish unfulfilled during the day may instigate a dream. But we must not forget that this is, after all, the wish of a child, that it is a wish impulse of the strength peculiar to childhood. I very much doubt whether a wish unfulfilled in the daytime would suffice to create a dream in an adult. It would rather seem that, as we learn to control our instinctual life by intellection, we more and more renounce as unprofitable the formation or retention of such intense wishes as are natural to childhood. In this, indeed, there may be individual variations. Some retain the infantile type of the psychic processes longer than others, just as we find such differences in the gradual decline of the originally vivid visual imagination. In general, however, I am of the opinion that unfulfilled wishes of the day are insufficient to produce a dream in adults. I will readily admit that the wish impulses originating in consciousness contribute to the instigation of dreams, but they probably do no more. The dream would not occur if the pre-conscious wish were not reinforced from another source. That source is the unconscious. I believe that the conscious wish becomes effective in exciting a dream only when it succeeds in arousing a similar unconscious wish which reinforces it. From the indications obtained in the psychoanalysis of the neuroses, I believe that these unconscious wishes are always active and ready to express themselves whenever they find an opportunity of allying themselves with an impulse from consciousness and transferring their own great intensity to the lesser intensity of the latter. It must therefore seem that the conscious wish alone has been realized in the dream, 
but a slight peculiarity in the form of the dream will put us on the track of the powerful ally from the unconscious. These ever active and, as it were, immortal wishes of our unconscious recall the legendary titans, who from time immemorial have been buried under the mountains which were once hurled upon them by the victorious gods, and even now quiver from time to time at the convulsions of their mighty limbs. These wishes existing in repression are themselves of infantile origin, as we learn from the psychological investigation of the neuroses. Let me therefore set aside the view previously expressed, that it matters little whence the dream wish originates, and replace it by another, namely, the wish manifested in the dream must be an infantile wish. In the adult it originates in the UCs, while in the child in whom no division and censorship exist as yet between the PCs and UCs, or in whom these are only in process of formation, it is an unfulfilled and unrepressed wish from the waking state. I am aware that this conception cannot be generally demonstrated, but I maintain that it can often be demonstrated even where one would have not suspected it, and that it cannot be generally refuted. They share this character of indestructibility with all other psychic acts that are really unconscious, that is, with psychic acts belonging solely to the system you seize. These paths are opened once and for all. They never fall into disease. They conduct the excitation process to discharge as often as they are charged again with unconscious excitation. To speak metaphorically, they suffer no other form of annihilation than did the shades of the lower regions in the Odyssey, who awoke to new life the moment they drank blood. The processes depending on the preconscious system are destructible in quite another sense. The psychotherapy of the neuroses is based on this difference. In dream formation, the wish impulses that are left over from the conscious waking life are, therefore, to be relegated to the background. I cannot admit that they play any part except that attributed to the material of actual sensations during sleep in relation to the dream content. If I now take into account those other psychic instigations left over from the waking life of the day, which are not wishes, I shall merely be adhering to the course mapped out for me by this line of thought. We may succeed in provisionally disposing of the energetic cathexis of our waking thoughts by deciding to go to sleep. He is a good sleeper who can do this. Napoleon I is reputed to have been a model of this kind, but we do not always succeed in doing it or in doing it completely. Unsolved problems, harassing cares, overwhelming impressions continue the activity of our thought even during sleep, maintaining psychic processes in the system which we have termed the preconscious. The thought impulses continued into sleep may be divided into the following groups. 1. Those which have not been completed during the day, owing to some accidental cause. 2. Those which have been left uncompleted because our mental parts have failed us, that is, unsolved problems. 3. Those which have been turned back and suppressed during the day. This is reinforced by a powerful fourth group. Those which have been excited in our UCs during the day by the working of the PCs. And, finally, we may add a fifth consisting of 5. The indifferent impressions of the day, which have therefore been left unsettled. We do not underrate the psychic intensities introduced into sleep by these residues of the day's waking life, especially those emanating from the group of the unsolved issues. It is certain that these excitations continue to strive for expression during the day, and we may assume with equal certainty that the state of sleep renders impossible the usual continuance of the process of excitation in the preconscious and its termination in becoming conscious. In so far as we have become conscious of our mental processes in the ordinary way, even during the night, to the extent we are simply not asleep. I cannot say what change is produced in the PC system by the state of sleep, but there is no doubt that the psychological characteristics of sleep are to be sought mainly in the cathetic changes occurring just in this system which dominates, moreover, the approach to motility paralyzed during sleep. On the other hand, I have found nothing in the psychology of dreams to warrant the assumption that sleep produces any but secondary changes in the conditions of the UC system. Hence, for the nocturnal excitations in the PCs, there remains no other path than that taken by the wish excitations from the UCs. They must seek reinforcement from the UCs and follow the detours of the unconscious excitations. But what is the relation of the preconscious day residues to the dream? There is no doubt that they penetrate abundantly into the dream, that they utilize the dream content to obtrude themselves upon consciousness even during the night. Indeed, they sometimes even dominate the dream content and impel it to continue the work of the day. It is also certain that the day residues may just as well have any other character as that of wishes. 
but it is highly instructive, and for the theory of wish-fulfillment, of quite decisive importance, to see what conditions they must comply with in order to be received into the dream. Let us pick out one of the dreams cited above. For example, the dream in which my friend Otto seems to show the symptoms of Basidau's disease. Chapter 5. D. Otto's appearance gave me some concern during the day, and this worry, like everything else relating to him, greatly affected me. I may assume that this concern followed me into sleep. I was probably bent on finding out what was the matter with him. During the night, my concern found expression in the dream which I have recorded. Not only was its content senseless, but it failed to show any wish fulfillment. But I began to search for the source of this incongruous expression of the solicitude felt during the day, and analysis revealed a connection. I identified my friend Otto with a certain Baron L., and myself with a Professor R. There was only one explanation of my being impelled to select just this substitute for the day, thought. I must always have been ready in the UCs to identify myself with Professor R., as this meant the realization of one of the immortal infantile wishes, viz., the wish to become great. Repulsive ideas respecting my friend, ideas that would certainly have been repudiated in waking state, took advantage of the opportunity to creep into the dream. But the worry of the day had likewise found some sort of expression by means of a substitute in the dream content. The day thought, which was in itself not a wish, but on the contrary a worry, had in some way to find a connection with some infantile wish, now unconscious and suppressed, which then allowed it, duly dressed up, to arise for consciousness. The more domineering the worry, the more forced could be the connection to be established. Between the content of the wish and that of the worry, there need be no connection, nor was there one in our example. It would perhaps be appropriate in dealing with this problem to inquire how a dream behaves when material is offered to it in the dream thoughts, which flatly opposes a wish fulfillment, such as justified worries, painful reflections, and distressing realizations. The many possible results may be classified as follows. A. The dream work succeeds in replacing all painful ideas by contrary ideas and suppressing the painful effect belonging to them. This then results in a pure and simple satisfaction dream, a palpable wish fulfillment, concerning which there is nothing more to be said. B. The painful ideas find their way into the manifest dream content, more or less modified, but nevertheless quite recognizable. This is the case which raises doubts about the wish theory of dreams, and thus calls for further investigation. Such dreams with a painful content may either be indifferent in feeling, or they may convey the whole painful effect, which the ideas contained in them seem to justify, or they may even lead to the development of anxiety to the point of waking. Analysis then shows that even these painful dreams are wish fulfillments, an unconscious and repressed wish whose fulfillment could not be felt as painful by the dreamer's ego has seized the opportunity offered by the continued cathexis of painful day residues, has lent them its support, and has thus made them capable of being dreamed. But whereas in case A, the unconscious wish coincided with the conscious one, in case B, the discord between the unconscious and the conscious, the repressed material and the ego is revealed, and the situation in the fairy tale of the three wishes which the fairy offers to the married couple is realized. The gratification in respect of the fulfillment of the repressed wish may prove to be so great that it balances the painful effects adhering to the day residues. The dream is then indifferent in its affective tone, although it is on the one hand the fulfillment of a wish and on the other the fulfillment of a fear. Or it may happen that the sleeper's ego plays an even more extensive part in the dream formation, that it reacts with violent resentment to the accomplished satisfaction of the repressed wish and even go so far as to make an end of the dream by means of anxiety. It is thus not difficult to recognize that dreams of pain and anxiety are, in accordance with our theory, just as much wish fulfillments as are the straightforward dreams of gratification. Painful dreams may also be punishment dreams. It must be admitted that the recognition of these dreams adds something that is, in a certain sense, new to the theory of dreams. What is fulfilled by them is once more an unconscious wish the wish for the punishment of the dreamer, for a repressed, prohibited wish impulse. To this extent, these dreams comply with the requirements here laid down, that the motive power behind the dream formation must be furnished by a wish belonging to the unconscious. But a finer psychological dissection allows us to recognize the difference between this and the other wish dreams. In the dreams of the group B, the unconscious dream-forming wish belonged to the repressed material. In the punishment dreams, it is likewise an unconscious wish, 
but one which we must attribute not to the repressed material, but to the ego. Punishment dreams point, therefore, to the possibility of a still more extensive participation of the ego in dream formation. The mechanism of dream formation becomes, indeed, in every way more transparent if in place of the antithesis conscious and unconscious, we put the antithesis ego and repressed. This, however, cannot be done without taking into account what happens in the psychoneuroses, and for this reason it has not been done in this book. Here I need only remark that the occurrence of punishment dreams is not generally subject to the presence of painful day residues. They originate, indeed, more readily if the contrary is true, if the thoughts which are day residues are of a gratifying nature, but express illicit gratifications. Of these thoughts, nothing, then, finds its way into the manifest dream except their contrary, just as was the case in the dreams of Group A. Thus it would be the essential characteristic of punishment dreams, that in them it is not the unconscious wish from the repressed material, from the system you seize, that is responsible for dream formation, but the punitive wish reacting against it, a wish pertaining to the ego, even though it is unconscious, that is, preconscious. I will elucidate some of the foregoing observations by means of a dream of my own, and above all, I will try to show how the dream work deals with a day residue involving painful expectation. Indistinct Beginning I tell my wife that I have some news for her, something very special. She becomes frightened and does not wish to hear it. I assure her that, on the contrary, it is something which will please her greatly, and I begin to tell her that our son's officer's corps has sent a sum of money, 5,000, something about honorable mention, distribution. At the same time, I have gone with her into a sitting room, like a storeroom, in order to fetch something from it. Suddenly, I see my son appear. He is not in uniform, but rather in a tight-fitting sports suit, like a seal with a small cap. He climbs onto a basket which stands to one side near a chest, in order to put something on this chest. I address him. No answer. It seems to me that his face or forehead is bandaged. He arranges something in his mouth, pushing something into it. Also his hair shows a glint of grey. I reflect. Can he be so exhausted? And has he false teeth? Before I can address him again, I awake without anxiety, but with palpitations. My clock points to 2.30 a.m. To give a full analysis is once more impossible. I shall therefore confine myself to emphasizing some decisive points. Painful expectations of the day had given occasion for this dream. Once again, there had been no news for over a week from my son, who was fighting at the front. It is easy to see that in the dream content, the conviction that he has been killed or wounded finds expression. At the beginning of the dream, one can observe an energetic effort to replace the painful thoughts by their contrary. I have to impart something very pleasing, something about sending money, honorable mention, and distribution. The sum of money originates in a gratifying incident of my medical practice. It is therefore trying to lead the dream away, altogether from its theme. But this effort fails. The boy's mother has a presentiment of something terrible and does not wish to listen. The disguises are too thin. The reference to the material to be suppressed shows through everywhere. If my son is killed, then his comrades will send back his property. I shall have to distribute whatever he has left among his sisters, brothers, and other people. Honorable mention is frequently awarded to an officer after he has died the hero's death. The dream thus strives to give direct expression to what it at first wished to deny, whilst at the same time the wish-fulfilling tendency reveals itself by distortion. The change of locality in the dream is no doubt to be understood as threshold symbolism, in line with Silberer's view. We have indeed no idea what lends it the requisite motive power, but my son does not appear as failing, on the field of battle, but climbing. He was in fact a daring mountaineer. He is not in uniform, but in a sports suit, that is, the place of the fatality now dreaded has been taken by an accident which happened to him at one time when he was ski-running, when he fell and fractured his thigh. But the nature of his costume, which makes him look like a seal, recalls immediately a younger person, our comical little grandson. The grey hair recalls his father, our son-in-law, who has had a bad time in the war. What does this signify? But let us leave this. The locality, a pantry, the chest from which he wants to take something, in the dream, to put something on it, are unmistakable allusions to an accident of my own, brought upon myself when I was between two and three years of age. I climbed on a footstool in the pantry in order to get something nice which was on a chest or table. The footstool tumbled over, and its edge struck me behind the lower jaw. I might very well have knocked all my teeth out. 
At this point an admonition presents itself. It serves you right, like a hostile impulse against the valiant warrior. A profounder analysis enables me to detect the hidden impulse which would be able to find satisfaction in the dreaded mishap to my son. It is the envy of youth which the elderly man believes that he has thoroughly stifled in actual life. There is no mistaking the fact that it was the very intensity of the painful apprehension lest such a misfortune should really happen that searched out for its alleviation such a repressed wish fulfillment. I can now clearly define what the unconscious wish means for the dream. I will admit that there is a whole class of dreams in which the incitement originates mainly or even exclusively from the residues of the day, and returning to the dream about my friend Otto, I believe that even my desire to become at last a professor extraordinarius would have allowed me to sleep in peace that night, had not the day's concern for my friend's health continued active. But this worry alone would not have produced a dream. The motive power needed by the dream had to be contributed by a wish, and it was the business of my concern to find such a wish for itself as the motive power of the dream. To put it figuratively, it is quite possible that a day thought plays the part of the entrepreneur in the dream, but the entrepreneur, who, as we say, has the idea and feels impelled to realize it, can do nothing without capital. He needs a capitalist who will defray the expense, and this capitalist, who contributes the psychic expenditure for the dream, is invariably and indisputably, whatever the nature of the waking thoughts, a wish from the unconscious. In other cases, the capitalist himself is the entrepreneur. This, indeed, seems to be the more usual case. An unconscious wish is excited by the day's work, and this now creates the dream. And the dream processes provide a parallel for all the other possibilities of the economic relationship here used as an illustration. Thus the entrepreneur may himself contribute a little of the capital, or several entrepreneurs may seek the aid of the same capitalists, or several capitalists may jointly supply the capital required by the entrepreneurs. Thus there are dreams sustained by more than one dream wish, and many similar variations, which may be readily imagined, and which are of no further interest to us. What is still lacking to our discussion of the dream wish, we shall only be able to complete later on. The tertium comparationis, in the analogies here employed, the quantitative element of which an allotted amount is placed at the free disposal of the dream, admits of a still closer application to the elucidation of the dream structure, as shown in Chapter 6b. We can recognize in most dreams a center supplied with a special sensory intensity. This is, as a rule, the direct representation of the wish fulfillment. For, if we reverse the displacements of the dream work, we find that the psychic intensity of the elements in the dream thoughts is replaced by the sensory intensity of the elements in the dream content. The elements in the neighborhood of the wish fulfillment have often nothing to do with its meaning, but prove to be the offshoots of painful thoughts which are opposed to the wish. But owing to their connection with the central element, often artificially established, they secure so large a share of its intensity as to become capable of representation. Thus the representative energy of the wish fulfillment diffuses itself over a certain sphere of association within which all elements are raised to representation, including even those that are in themselves without resources. In dreams containing several dynamic wishes, we can easily separate and delimit the spheres of the individual wish fulfillments and we shall find that the gaps in the dream are often of the nature of boundary zones. Although the foregoing remarks have restricted the significance of the day residues for the dream, they are nonetheless deserving of some further attention, for they must be a necessary ingredient in dream formation, inasmuch as experience reveals the surprising fact that every dream shows in its content a connection with a recent waking impression often of the most indifferent kind. So far, we have failed to understand the necessity for this addition to the dream mixture, Chapter 5a. This necessity becomes apparent only when we bear in mind the part played by the unconscious wish and seek further information in the psychology of the neuroses. We shall then learn that an unconscious idea, as such, is quite incapable of entering into the preconscious, and that it can exert an influence there only by establishing touch with a harmless idea already belonging to the preconscious to which it transfers its intensity, and by which it allows itself to be screened. This is the fact of transference, which furnishes the explanation of so many surprising occurrences in the psychic life of neurotics. The transference may leave the idea from the pre-conscious unaltered, though the latter will thus acquire an unmerited intensity, or it may force upon this some modification derived from the content of the transferred idea. I trust the reader will pardon my fondness for comparisons with daily life, but I feel tempted to say, 
that the situation for the repressed idea is like that of the American dentist in Austria, who may not carry on his practice unless he can get a duly installed doctor of medicine to serve him as a signboard and legal cover. Further, just as it is not exactly the busiest physician who forms such alliances with dental practitioners, so in the psychic life the choice as regards covers for the repressed ideas does not fall upon such preconscious or conscious ideas as have themselves attracted enough of the attention active in the preconscious. The unconscious prefers to entangle with its connections either those impressions and ideas of the preconscious which have remained unnoticed as being indifferent or those which have immediately had attention withdrawn from them again by rejection. It is a well-known proposition of the theory of associations confirmed by all experience that ideas which have formed a very intimate connection in one direction assume a negative type of attitude towards whole groups of new connections. I have even attempted at one time to base a theory of hysterical paralysis on this principle. If we assume that the same need of transference on the part of the repressed ideas, of which we have become aware through the analysis of neurosis, makes itself felt in the dreams also, we can at once explain two of the problems of the dream, namely, that every dream analysis reveals an interweaving of a recent impression, and that this recent element is often of the most indifferent character. We may add what we have already learned elsewhere, that the dream why these recent and indifferent elements so frequently find their way into the dream content as substitutes for the very oldest elements of the dream thoughts is that they have the least to fear from the resisting censorship. But while this freedom from censorship remains only the preference shown to the trivial elements, the constant presence of recent elements points to the necessity for transference. Both groups of impressions satisfy the demand of the repressed ideas for material still free from associations. The indifferent ones because they have offered no occasion for extensive associations and the recent ones because they have not had sufficient time to form such associations. We thus see that the day residues among which we may now include the indifferent impressions not only borrow something from the UCs when they secure a share in dream formation, namely the motive power at the disposal of the repressed wish, but they also offer to the unconscious something that is indispensable to it, namely the points of attachment necessary for transference. If we wish to penetrate more deeply into the psychic processes, we should have to throw a clearer light on the play of excitations between the pre-conscious and the unconscious, and indeed the study of the psychoneuroses would impel us to do so. But dreams, as it happens, give us no help in this respect. Just one further remark as to the day residues. There is no doubt that it is really these that disturb our sleep, and not our dreams which, on the contrary, strive to guard our sleep. But we shall return to this point later. End of section 42 Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Section 43 of The Interpretation of Dreams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud Translated by A. A. Brill Section 43 The Wish Fulfillment, Part 2 So far we have discussed the dream wish. We have traced it back to the sphere of the UCs and have analyzed its relation to the day residues, which in their turn may be either wishes or psychic impulses of any other kind or simply recent impressions. We have thus found room for the claims that can be made for the dream-forming significance of our waking mental activity in all its multifariousness. It might even prove possible to explain, on the basis of our train of thought, these extreme cases in which the dream, continuing the work of the day, brings to a happy issue an unsolved problem of waking life. We merely lack a suitable example to analyze in order to uncover the infantile or repressed source of wishes the tapping of which has so successfully reinforced the efforts of the pre-conscious activity. But we are not a step nearer to answering the question. Why is it that the unconscious can furnish in sleep nothing more than the motive power for a wish fulfillment? The answer to this question must elucidate the psychic nature of the state of wishing, and it will be given with the aid of the notion of the psychic apparatus. We do not doubt that this apparatus, too, 
has only arrived at its present perfection by a long process of evolution. Let us attempt to restore it as it existed in an earlier stage of capacity. From postulates to be confirmed in other ways, we know that at first the apparatus strove to keep itself as free from stimulation as possible, and therefore in its early structure adopted the arrangement of a reflex apparatus which enabled it promptly to discharge by the motor parts any sensory excitation reaching it from without. But this simple function was disturbed by the exigences of life, to which the apparatus owes the impetus toward further development. The exigences of life first confronted it in the form of the great physical needs. The excitation aroused by the inner need seeks an outlet in motility, which we may describe as internal change or expression of the emotions. The hungry child cries or struggles helplessly, but its situation remains unchanged, for the excitation proceeding from the inner need has not the character of a momentary impact, but of a continuing pressure. A change can occur only if, in some way, in the case of the child by external assistance, there is an experience of satisfaction which puts an end to the internal excitation. An essential constituent of this experience is the appearance of a certain percept of food in our example the memory image of which is henceforth associated with the memory trace of the excitation arising from the need. Thanks to the established connection, there results at the next occurrence of this need a psychic impulse which seeks to revive the memory image of the former percept and to re-evoke the former percept itself, that is, it actually seeks to re-establish the situation of the first satisfaction. Such an impulse is what we call a wish. The reappearance of the perception constitutes the wish fulfillment, and the full cathexis of the perception by the excitation springing from the need constitutes the shortest path to the wish fulfillment. We may assume a primitive state of the psychic apparatus in which this path is actually followed, that is, in which the wish ends in hallucination. This first psychic activity therefore aims at an identity of perception, that is, at a repetition of that perception which is connected with the satisfaction of the need. The primitive mental activity must have been modified by bitter practical experience into a secondary and more appropriate activity. The establishment of identity of perception by the short regressive path within the apparatus does not produce the same result in another respect as follows upon cathexis of the same perception coming from without. The satisfaction does not occur, and the need continues. In order to make the internal cathexis equivalent to the external one, the former would have to be continuously sustained, just as actually happens in the hallucinatory psychosis and in hunger fantasies, which exhaust their performance in maintaining their hold on the object desired. In order to attain to more appropriate use of the psychic energy, it becomes necessary to suspend the full regression so that it does not proceed beyond the memory image, and thence can seek other paths, leading ultimately to the production of the desired identity from the side of the outer world. This inhibition, as well as the subsequent deflection of the excitation, becomes the task of a second system, which controls voluntary motility, that is, a system whose activity first leads on to the use of motility for purposes remembered in advance. But all this complicated mental activity, which works its way from the memory image to the production of identity of perception via the outer world, merely represents a roundabout way to wish fulfillment made necessary by experience. Thinking is indeed nothing but a substitute for the hallucinatory wish, and if the dream is called a wish fulfillment, this becomes something self-evident, since nothing but a wish can impel our psychic apparatus to activity. The dream which fulfills its wishes by following the short regressive path has thereby simply preserved for us a specimen of the primary method of operation of the psychic apparatus which has been abandoned as inappropriate. What once prevailed in the waking state, when our psychic life was still young and inefficient, seems to have been banished into our nocturnal life, just as we still find in the nursery those discarded primitive weapons of adult humanity, the bow and arrow. Dreaming is a fragment of the superseded psychic life of the child. In the psychoses, these modes of operation of the psychic apparatus, which are normally suppressed in the waking state, reassert themselves, and thereupon betray their inability to satisfy our demands in the outer world. The unconscious wish impulses evidently strive to assert themselves even during the day, and the fact of transference as well as the psychoses tells us that they endeavor to force their way through the preconscious system to consciousness 
and the command of motility. Thus, in the censorship between the UCs and PCs, which the dream forces us to assume, we must recognize and respect the guardian of our psychic health. But it is not carelessness on the part of this guardian to diminish his vigilance at night and to allow the suppressed impulses of the UCs to achieve expression, thus again making possible the process of hallucinatory regression. I think not, for when the critical guardian goes to rest and we have proof that his slumber is not profound, he takes care to close the gate to motility. No matter what impulses from the usually inhibited UCs may bustle about the stage, there is no need to interfere with them. They remain harmless because they are not in a position to set in motion the motor apparatus which alone can operate to produce any change in the outer world. Sleep guarantees the security of the fortress which has to be guarded. The state of affairs is less harmless when a displacement of energies is produced, not by the decline at night in the energy put forth by the critical censorship, but by the pathological enfeeblement of the latter, or the pathological reinforcement of the unconscious excitations, and this while the preconscious is cathected and the gates of motility are open. The guardian is then overpowered. The unconscious excitations subdue the PCs, and from the PCs they dominate our speech and action, or they force hallucinatory regressions, thus directing an apparatus not designed for them by virtue of the attraction exerted by perceptions on the distribution of our psychic energy. We call this condition psychosis. We now find ourselves in the most favorable position for continuing the construction of our psychological scaffolding, which we left after inserting the two systems, UCs and PCs. However, we still have reason to give further consideration to the wish as the sole psychic motive power in the dream. We have accepted the explanation that the reason why the dream is in every case a wish fulfillment is that it is a function of the system UCs which knows no other aim than wish fulfillment and which has at its disposal no forces other than the wish impulses. Now, if we want to continue for a single moment longer to maintain our right to develop such far-reaching psychological speculations from the facts of dream interpretation, we are in duty-bound to show that they insert the dream into a context which can also embrace other psychic structures. If there exists a system of the UCs or something sufficiently analogous for the purposes of our discussion, the dream cannot be its sole manifestation. Every dream may be a wish fulfillment, but there must be other forms of abnormal wish fulfillment as well as dreams. And in fact, the theory of all psychoneurotic systems culminates in the one proposition that they too must be conceived as wish fulfillments of the unconscious. Our explanation makes the dream only the first member of a series of the greatest importance for the psychiatrist, the understanding of which means the solution of the purely psychological part of the psychiatric problem. But in other members of this group of wish fulfillments, for example, in the hysterical symptoms, I know of one essential characteristic which I have so far failed to find in the dream. Thus, from the investigations often alluded to in this treatise, I know that the formation of an hysterical symptom needs a junction of both the currents of our psychic life. The symptom is not merely the expression of a realized unconscious wish. The latter must be joined by another wish from the preconscious, which is fulfilled by the same symptom, so that the symptom is at least doubly determined once by each of the conflicting systems. Just as in dreams, there is no limit to further over-determination. The determination which does not derive from the UCs is, as far as I can see, invariably a thought stream of reaction against the unconscious wish, for example, a self-punishment. Hence I can say, quite generally, that an hysterical symptom originates only when two contrary wish fulfillments having their source in different psychic systems, are able to meet in a single expression. Examples would help us but little here, as nothing but a complete unveiling of the complications in question can carry conviction. I will therefore content myself with a bare assertion, and will cite one example, not because it proves anything, but simply as an illustration. The hysterical vomiting of a female patient proved, on the one hand, to be the fulfillment of an unconscious fantasy from the years of puberty, namely the wish that she might be continually pregnant and have a multitude of children, and this was subsequently supplemented by the wish that she might have them by as many fathers as possible. Against this immoderate wish there arose a powerful defensive reaction, but as by the vomiting the patient might have spoiled her figure and her beauty, so that she would no longer find favor in any man's eyes, the symptom was also in keeping with the punitive trend of thought, and so, being admissible on both sides, it was allowed to become a reality. 
This is the same way of acceding to a wish fulfillment as the queen of the Parthians was pleased to adopt in the case of the triumvir Crassus. Believing that he had undertaken his campaign out of greed for gold, she caused molten gold to be poured into the troth of the corpse. Here thou hast what thou hast longed for. Of the dream we know as yet only that it expresses a wish fulfillment of the unconscious, and apparently the dominant preconscious system permits this fulfillment when it has compelled the wish to undergo certain distortions. We are, moreover, not in fact in a position to demonstrate regularly the presence of a train of thought opposed to the dream wish, which is realized in the dream as well as its antagonist. Only now and then have we found in the dream analyses signs of reaction products as, for instance, my affection for my friend R in the dream of my uncle. But the contribution from the pre-conscious which is missing here may be found in another place. The dream can provide expression for a wish from the UCs by means of all sorts of distortions. Once the dominant system has withdrawn itself into the wish to sleep and has realized this wish by producing the changes of cathexis within the psychic apparatus which are within its power, thereupon holding on to the wish in question for the whole duration of sleep. Now, this persistent wish to sleep on the part of the pre-conscious has a quite general facilitating effect on the formation of dreams. Let us recall the dream of the father, who, by the gleam of light from the death chamber, was led to conclude that his child's body might have caught fire. We have shown that one of the psychic forces decisive in causing the father to draw this conclusion in the dream, instead of allowing himself to be awakened by the gleam of the light, was the wish to prolong the life of the child seen in the dream by one moment. Other wishes originating in the repressed have probably escaped us, for we are unable to analyze this dream. But as a second source of motive power in this dream, we may add the father's desire to sleep. For, like the life of the child, the father's sleep is prolonged for a moment by the dream. The underlying motive is, let the dream go on, or I must wake up. As in the dream, so in all others, the wish to sleep lends its support to the unconscious wish. In Chapter 3, we cited dreams which were manifestly dreams of convenience. But in truth, all dreams may claim this designation. The efficacy of the wish to go on sleeping is most easily recognized in the awakening dreams, which so elaborate the external sensory stimulus that it becomes compatible with the continuance of sleep. They weave it into a dream in order to rob it of any claims it might make as a reminder of the outer world. But this wish to go on sleeping must also play its part in permitting all other dreams which can only act as disturbers of the state of sleep from within. Don't worry, sleep on, it's only a dream. Is in many cases the suggestion of the PCs to consciousness where the dream gets too bad, and this describes in a quite general way the attitude of our dominant psychic activity towards dreaming, even though the thought remains unuttered. I must draw the conclusion that throughout the whole of our sleep, we are just as certain that we are dreaming as we are certain that we are sleeping. It is imperative to disregard the objection that our consciousness is never directed to the latter knowledge and that it is directed to the former knowledge only on special occasions when the censorship feels, as it were, taken by surprise.